excited for the event tonight. Very happy to have both David and Eric Bailey. So I'm going to do a quick intro and then hand it off to you. Uh, David Brown, for those of you who don't know him, is the Vice President of Innovation Leadership at the Greater Boston Chamber, Commerce, Chamber of Commerce, and he's our host moderator tonight. Very honored to have him. He's providing leadership to cultivate technology and innovation ecosystem growth in the Greater Boston region. Before joining the Chamber, he was uh, Executive Director at TUGG, or TUG, Technology Underwriting Greater Good. A community, a community engagement platform that connects New England tech entrepreneurs with the riskiest social enterprises serving local under its source and the resource youth. Uh, he's also a council member of uh, One in Three Boston, helping advise Major Martin Walsh on issues relevant to Boston under 35 population and, and plans programs to unify that community. So David will be uh, doing the honors of hosting uh, Eric. And Eric is the co-founder and managing partner at Founder Collective, a seed stage venture capital fund. Uh, he led Founder Collective investments into numerous companies, including early investors in companies like Uber, O Power, MakerBot, Hotel Tonight, QV, BookUp, and many others. Uh, previously, Eric funded Brontes Technologies, a 3D imaging company uh, which was acquired in 2006 by 3M. And he has served as entrepreneur in residence at the Harvard Business School. Uh, he's a frequent blogger at TechCrunch and a board member of the New England Venture of Capital Association. Uh, please join me in welcoming Eric and David with a very loud and warm welcome at the startup stage. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, and just to reiterate the, the start, I just want to thank Carlos and Evan. Uh, I met Carlos about two weeks ago, and he kind of gave me a little bit of history about what you guys have started doing here. Um, and it's an amazing program. And I know both Eric and I are both very excited about seeing the proliferation of the startup community. So having all of you guys out here and having this discussion means a lot to us. To give you a little bit of background, the reason we wanted to start a little bit early is we're in the middle of a really interesting kind of political cycle, a lot of really interesting conversational pieces that are going through the House right now, uh, moving into the Senate uh, for passage here in Massachusetts that affect the startup landscape. Well, that's not normally what we talk about at startup conversations. We wanted to make sure that we had a little bit of extra time before Q&A to dive into those things, because I think it, one will be relevant, but two will be really interesting to kind of get two different points. Quick background on me, uh, as Carlos mentioned, I'm Vice President of Innovation Leadership at the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce has been around for a little over 100 years now, uh, formed in the 1880s, focusing on the contemporary issues of businesses across the greater Massachusetts area. Fundamentally, we focus on three things. It's networking, it's uh, kind of advocacy, policy focus issues, and then education. So we provide programs to work with Harvard, MIT, T. Simmons, Babson, to be able to help both emerging and growing leaders to get to the next stage. Um, so, with my history here, love to kind of jump in with Eric and get a little bit of history. And, you know, I, I, as we've already talked about with Carlos, great history with Founder Collective, great history with Brontes. We'll get into those stories, but love to kind of get into kind of the historiographical history of you. Where are you from? What's your background? Before you got to Dartmouth, how, how did you kind of get your life up and going? <laughs> Well, I guess my parents get credit for that. But um, this is a funny uh, change of roles, right? Because I host an event called Founder Dialogues, and I'm always doing the interviewing. So um, we'll see if I can get comfortable being the person being interviewed. Um, so I was born in New York. I'm a Mets fan. I grew up in Long Island. Um, and somebody else? Oh, there we go. Uh, Mets won today, in case anyone was worried. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, it actually, interestingly, had all of these sort of entrepreneurial endeavors as a kid that at the time I just didn't think of that way. My parents were very sort of pre-professional track in kind of the way they um, related to kind of my education and what I was doing. So I always thought I'd be a lawyer, even though I had all these interests always. And at some point, it was time to go become a lawyer. And I just realized I didn't want to be one. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. but. Um, that's a bit of background. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great starting point. I mean, I, I'd be kind of interested. Obviously, you, you did go to Dartmouth undergrad. Right out of that, you had a little bit of experience hanging out with Michael Porter and working with the Monitor Group. Yeah. Very short kind of stint. How did you know it was time to, to get into your first company, and what was kind of the process of getting that first company up and going? Yeah, so I was duped into going into consulting. I don't know if anyone else here, anyone here in consulting? Okay, anyone else here thought they were duped going into consulting? No? Okay, so I, 
I thought I was duped. So the, I think the consulting firms, this actually gets to like one of my core Massachusetts initiatives, yep. right? So there's a bunch of stuff I've gotten really into around how we make this a better tech ecosystem. And one of them is the talent pipeline from the schools. And I look at the investment banks and I look at the consulting firms and I think they do a brilliant job convincing students that they're bringing them into these incredible career paths. And I actually don't think they're very strong career paths at all. But I was totally duped by that. I was sold really, really well that these were terrific career paths. For what it's worth, I started at Lazard doing investment banking yeah. and almost went to Monitor. So I know there that you go. very heavily. And was it a great career path? It was a terrible career path. Yeah, and we could talk about why, but I really think they sell a pretty bad bill of goods unless you really are excited to spend your career as a consultant. It's a lot like don't go to law school if you don't want to spend your career as a lawyer because it doesn't really set you up for much else, even though at least my parents believed it was the best education you could have for anything. I just don't think it's true anymore. And I think consulting is not that widely respected as it is sold to be. Uh, I didn't mean to start off by bashing consulting. <laughs> but I really just thought it was um, pretty quickly realized it was a pretty big waste of time. I was really there to help validate what management teams already wanted to do but needed some third party to validate for their board, which is the primary role, in my view, of consulting. Pretty harsh point of view on it, but I really believe this um, from my own experience. And I just wanted out. I mean, I just very quickly realized, you know, probably within six months that I didn't want to do this the rest of my career, and I didn't want to do this even for the next week. Um, but I had um, been given a $5,000 signing bonus, and you know, the, my understanding was if you left in less than a year, you owed them back the bonus, and I didn't have $5,000. So I started, you know, maybe kind of naive as a 22-year-old um, to think they would have come after me or whatnot, but I stuck around for a year to the day so that I wouldn't know them. It's also like my own personal ethos of not um, breaking commitments I've made. So I stayed a year to the day and I spent the last six months trying to spend, trying to think about what I could do with virtually no capital that would allow me to start something because I always had wanted to start something. Um, and luckily Silicon Alley, which people, people were calling the New York tech ecosystem back ages ago in 1999, was pretty hot and pretty exciting, and I was I wanted to be a part of it. And so um, I was excited, inspired to try to find something to do. And back then, you know, sort of the equivalent today of building a mobile agency, I built a web agency, um, and I got, convinced my brother and my cousin to leave their jobs, uh, and we all started Abstract Edge together back in 1999. So that, that's how I, I shifted out of the bad bill of goods of consulting. Wonderful. And, and, you know, I think one of the pieces that's obviously interesting is with Abstract Edge, you spent a little time as the CEO, moved over to the chairman position, but then at the same time, you ended up going back to get your MBA. Yes. The experience that we often hear is kind of being lambasted within the startup community. Why did you end up going back? Yeah. What was the trajectory of Abstract Edge and how did that all come so, to be? So that's more a story of love than a story of business. So, um, you know, I fell in love in college. Uh, I'm married to Shirley today, but we've been together a long time. And um, part of the reason I didn't go to law school is, you know, we would have been going to different law schools and different geographies, and I wasn't that excited to go to law school. So I said, well, why don't I defer law school, and I'll go to New York, and I'll take this job in consulting. And she went to NYU Law School. And um, she loved law school, but watching her go to law school made me less excited about law school. But the, the day we started Abstract Edge, um, my partners knew that I was planning to leave and go to school. So it was really like, I'm gonna start this with you guys, we're gonna get off the ground, you have great skill sets to build this business, um, I'll be here a year or two, and then I'm, I'm gonna be going and doing something else. And then, because we were supposed to move to Boston and I was deferring law school, my, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, is a really, she's really smart and she was top of her class and um, looking for a clerkship, and those are really hard to get. And she told the office that helps you with that at NYU that, um, she would only take one in Boston because we were moving to Boston, which they said was sort of like suicide in terms of getting one of these things because you can't just decide you're going to get a federal clerkship only in Boston. Well, of course, she got one. And this is, you know, you get this kind of strange. You get this at like the beginning of your second year of law school. So it's pretty early in the whole game. And so she got this clerkship for when she graduated, but it was way before. Um, and then by the time um, she graduated, she said, okay, so we're going to Boston or some months before. And I was like, well, I don't know, this business is going kind of well and um, why don't we stay here? And she was like, yeah, it's not going to work that way. So um, she's like, I'm going to Boston. I hope you'll come with me. Uh, so I, I started thinking about, probably more than six months, but I started thinking about maybe I didn't want to go to law school. Maybe I go to business school. Um, the other thing that was happening, and this is an instructive 
statement for this time. I was actually thinking about this earlier today. In really good times, really heady times, people get ahead of themselves professionally. I don't want to say ahead of themselves, but we tend to have more confidence in taking risk and we don't understand why would somebody take a more junior position or develop inside a good institution or those types of things. We're just like, may as well get out there and do it. And that's what was going on in 99 when I started Abstract Edge. By late 2000, my business was really going pretty badly. I mean, it was, it was not badly, but it was not going well. Um, I was struggling. I had gone from being in 99 the kind of person people wanted to buy these services from, like the young, I don't seem as young anymore, but 23 years old, the young entrepreneur that knows tech and knows digital and um, big uh, company CMOs, they wanted this type of person to help them with their strategies. By late 2000, it flipped completely. So the joke I used to make is if you went into Central Park, we started the company in New York, in 1999 and screamed, I'm a web developer, everyone came flocking to you. And if you did that in late 2000, everyone ran as fast as they could in the other direction. And, and I think, you know, in tougher times, you step back and say, I've got a lot to learn. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm educating people about digital marketing. I've never studied marketing. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so I was pretty excited to go to business school. Um, I found a much more qualified CEO to run Abstract Edge. Um, that didn't work out that well, but that's a story for another time. And, um, and, I, and I left to go to business school. Excellent. So tell us kind of that transition. I mean, obviously, Abstract Edge was a great experience, but what you're, you're kind of known for is Bronte's, which can, can formed as you were coming out of business school. What's the story there? How did that kind of get going? What did you learn along the way? So, so agencies are actually really tough businesses. So one of the things I learned at Abstract Edge was, you know, our um, sales were sort of like a sign curve, but our expenses were sort of linear and up. And I just think those are really, we're in Pivotal Labs, they've managed that brilliantly well, but it, it, it is a hard business. And I just wanted very badly to found a company that built a game-changing product that if we got right, people would just want and we could replicate over and over and over again instead of bespoke consulting solutions to, or consult is the wrong word, but consultata consultative solutions to co clients that you had to reinvent over and over and over again. And so that was a key driver of, of what I was looking for. And I teamed up um, very early on in business school with Micah Rosenblum, who had founded a venture back business before school. And it was a burnout time at Harvard Business School. The joke was B2B meant back to banking and B2C meant, ba meant back to consulting, right? It was nobody wanted to be a entrepreneur in 2000, class of 2003 at Harvard Business School, right? The economy was in the toilet. All the young entrepreneurs had sort of burnt out in the dot-com bust. And then our first week of school, 9-11 happened. There just wasn't a lot of appetite for being an entrepreneur in our class that year. By the way, many people have since become entrepreneurs, but at that time. And there was a handful, a few of us, Chris Dixon, Raj Dada, David Frankel, Michael Rosenblum, just a handful that really wanted to do this, had been bit by the bug and wanted to keep building companies. And so Mike and I were kindred spirits. We found each other. We went looking for some things to work on. We, we actually went to an MIT business plan competition mixer to pitch some, uh, some engineers on something we were looking at in point of sale credit card fraud. And uh, we met a guy who seemed like a grad student, turned out he was tenured faculty at MIT, who said, yeah, yeah, what you guys are working on, that's kind of interesting, I think it would work, but what I'm doing is much more interesting. And you should come to my lab and see what I'm doing. And so we did. And uh, we never used any of the technology, but the team that, that had been there at MIT combined with the two of us, we ended up launching Bronte's Technologies. So for those who don't know, what is the history on Bronte's technology? Yeah, it's starting to become ancient history, but um, it's, it's a while ago now. But um, we founded this company way back in 2002 that was built on 3D imaging technology or concepts. Again, we, we shifted the technology a lot, but originally born out of MIT. And um, we looked... We spent a lot of time looking for applications. So we were very resolved that we weren't going to build a, a solution looking for a problem. We needed to find a problem to go solve that our technology could be a solution to, which is part of the reason why we shifted the technology. Um, the problem we decided to solve was sort of the last one that I would have thought would have been interesting to us. But as we dug in and kept moving, you know, peeling back layers of the onion, it got incredibly interesting, which is that dentistry is the last cottage industry, the largest remaining cottage industry in the world, right? I've been saying that now for a long time and nobody's given me a better example. But every unit of production in dentistry is done by an artisan by hand. 
It's completely unique to the individual. And the year we founded Brontes, I don't know if anyone has a good guess, which company claimed to be the biggest mass customizer in the world in 2003? Any guesses? Nobody has a guess? Who would have, in two, big company, that in 2003 would claim to be the world's largest mass customizer? Nike. Ni I don't think Nike was doing customization back then. Maybe they were, but, but I never heard them make the claim. Dell. And, what was that? Dell. Dell. Dell claimed to be the biggest mass customizer in the world. They weren't even doing mass customization. They were doing mass configuration. Right? So it was permutations on a single line for production, which is, by the way, pretty amazing. And I think it was something in the order of 50,000 permutations. Right? I want a server, I want a desktop, or I want a laptop. And then what size screen, and what RAM, and what, you know, it's all this configuration they could make one after another, these types of machines. Um, we were trying to do 100% unique, infinite permutations, right? A true mass customization. The idea is you scan the mouth, you replace the dental impression, you create a digital input to hopefully a digital process for production. And people had already been building digital processes for production. Invisalign, who probably was at the time the leading mass customizer in the world, even though they didn't claim that, um, was doing that for orthodontia. Um, and there were a bunch of companies doing milling, CAD CAM milling for crowns, which is actually the biggest application in dentistry. A little bit on the implant side. But all of these processes started with an impression. And 90 plus percent of impressions are substandard. So if you could actually scan the mouth and start with a quality digital input, you'd have a very powerful value creation on the output side, enable mass customization across the industry. So that was our pitch 13 years ago. Um, still, the whole industry has not flipped to that, but, but 3M bought our company in 2006, and they sell thousands of these units a year um, doing the scanning side, enabling digital output. So it's growing very fast, the digital output side. So I think one of the most interesting pieces, especially for these guys, is not just the story about what you created, but how you got out of that company, right? It's, it's pretty amazing both in terms of timing, but then on, in terms of the demand. Maybe you can talk about kind of the exiting yeah, the Brontes I mean, and how that happened. When you say get, get out, it sounded yeah. like we were trying to escape. And, and we, we, it's dentistry, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, there you go. Um, right, you always want to get out of the chair as fast as possible. Um, we were not in a rush to get out, but we in many ways did create our exit. Um, we would have been very satisfied if it didn't materialize at that time too because we really believed in the future of the company. Um, but I remember Mike and I chatting about the business um, and being almost surprised nobody had actually come to see us to buy the business yet. Just there was, it was so clear that the industry was trying to move this way and there weren't good solutions for it. And everyone in the industry we'd show our solution to would say, like, oh my God, and I didn't think it was possible, right? The biggest lab owner in the world is, I don't know how to say the world, in the US, probably in the world, this guy named Jim Glidewell. Um, and when we showed him our solution, he, he actually went to dinner that night and he raised a glass and he said, they said it wasn't possible and tonight we saw it. Right? I mean, that was the level of validation we were getting for what we did. And I remember saying to Micah, boy, if somebody just fired a shot, I think we'd have a war, right, to fight over this company. And we were going out for more capital, and we always thought our VCs sort of underappreciated us, just didn't really, we were in dentistry, right? Like, they didn't really totally get what we were doing, and it was always this battle. Who were your funders at that point? Um, we had very good investors, but I just sort of want to put it in context. Um, we had B Bain Capital Ventures, Charles River Ventures, and what today is Flybridge Capital Partners. And they were great supportive investors, but they were always a little... It, it seemed like every day we had to convince them that this was actually a good idea, right? They just didn't know our market. You know, we get all this market-based evidence that they get all excited about, but then they'd think about it more and be like, am I crazy? Why am I doing this thing? Like, it wasn't something that I think directly resonated with them. Um, so we were, you know, I, I actually wanted an offer on the company just to sort of validate the, mar the market commitment to this, not thinking we'd sell. Um, As well, I just kind of price what the next VC round might look even, like. Even if we didn't price it, just trying to get across to investors that the industry really cared. I felt like there was an asymmetry between how important this was in the industry and how, our, how the venture community viewed what we were doing, even though we'd gotten some good financial support. And so one of the things we did was we went out to the three candidates that we thought were most interesting in the industry to see if they were interested in doing a strategic investment to lead our next round. And all three of them were. And so we went into diligence with them along with institutional uh, financial investors. Um, in retrospect, I think strategic money at that stage would have been a terrible idea. In the moment, we got convinced that one of the companies would be ideal. Um, and they were going to lead a $25 million round into our company. And so we called one of the companies we were turning down that wanted to lead this round uh, and told them we weren't going to go with them. 
very deliberately the way we did it, but we called them and told them that, and they said, we've got to convince you otherwise. Can we come up to see you, ne you know, next week? And we said, sure, you can come up, but I, I think it's, it's going to be hard to convince us. And they came up, and we went to dinner, the COO and the head of corp dev for that company, big public company, and um, went to dinner, and they said, what can we do to convince you? And we said, well, we really feel like you're going to create a conflicted situation for us in the future. We don't feel like you're this other company in the space. I think my mic went out but that this other company in the space would be a problem for us. Um, and if, uh, you know, absent buying us for an amount of money that would be absolutely unprecedented for a pre-revenue company in this industry, I don't think there's much you can do. So that was like on a Tuesday. On Friday, they gave us a term sheet to buy the company for 55 to $65 million, um, which was in the scope of what our financing was in terms of valuation. So we then, we had been building relationships with all the key players in the industry for two years. We just called them all and said, listen, you know, you said at some point if anyone ever came along and put in an offer, call you first. This is the moment if you're interested. And all five of the major companies in the industry that were in a position that we'd let in the door, there were two others we wouldn't let in the door, but that we'd let in the door, that were in a position to buy us, made bids to buy us. Um, and that was a four-month process that resulted in 3M buying the company. Awesome. Is your microphone back on now? I don't know. Nope. All right. I wonder if I knocked it off. Huh? It says it's bad. Is that battery? All right. We'll just do a past okay. mic scenario then. Um, excellent. So you finally got out. Great exit. Finally got out. Out of dentistry. Yeah, exactly. So that's in the 2006. We know what kind of happened. Can I make two points and finally get out? So, <laughs> so two key points on this. One is the story I just told you sounds much more mercenary in some ways than it is because I think it is useful in terms of understanding a, a process and what it might look like. But a couple points here. One is we ultimately went with 3M not because they were the high bidder but because we thought they were the best partner for us long term. We also trusted them the most, and in closing a deal like this and ultimately getting the escrow, tru pay, you know, the money gets held back in these deals. Working with a party you really trust matters. But it was the place that our team wanted to be the most, so that was very important to us. The other thing is, we had 32 people at the time of the acquisition. Two and a half years later when I left, 29 of them were still at the company. I was the third person Sorry, yeah, third person to leave two and a half years later. So it definitely wasn't that anyone was looking to get out, but it was the right time to sell because they were buying enough of our future value that I think it would have been foolish not to sell. Side point, and we never could have predicted this, um, you know, two and a half years later, world financial crisis, you know, we were in our first year of sales. That, that could have been very brutal for the company. And that's probably... Particularly pointing, and we can get into that more as we think about some of the environment that's happening now and kind of the fundraise environment that we're seeing. You, you get out, not finally, you actually get out, and you know you spend a few more years desperately, but you spend a few more years kind of figuring out the the personal exit plan. Two thousand nine, you come out, founder collective. What's the story? How? Why VC at this point? Who was your team? How did you start to put that together? How did you think about that as kind of, as the name implies, a founder-oriented team? So David Frankel was our first investor in Brontes. This was a business school classmate that Mike and I had known from our time in class together. Dave was a section mate of mine. He had founded the largest ISP in the Southern Hemisphere. Way, you had unbelievable VCs in that class it, when you were naming Dixon and I, I think good entrepreneurs who ultimately over time did yep. become VCs, which which is exciting uh, to see as well. I mean, there's this evolution of contribution to the ecosystem that people hopefully go through, and I, I think it's been a good it's been a it was a good class yep. ultimately. Uh, I think partially because the people who did entrepreneurship were really committed to doing this stuff. Um, Sorry, so Dave Frankel was our first investor and he wrote a real check. When I say like, you know, there are a lot of angels out there and God bless them who write $50,000 checks, $20,000 checks, put you in business at some level, but not really put you in business. The best they can hopefully do is use their money to advocate and convince other people to also give you money, which can be very powerful. And there's some people around town who do that incredibly well, uh, even if they're writing small checks. But David wrote us a half a million dollar check. It was very non-trivial, right? It really did put us in business. And over the years we were doing Brontes, David was 
doing a lot of angel investing from South Africa, super angel investing at a time where very few people were really doing big checks into startups. And he'd often ask us to either be a reference for him, you know, I'm competing for this deal with some venture fund, the people don't know me well, would you mind being a reference? Happy to do it. He was a great investor. Um, or he'd say, um, hey, listen, I'm not going to be able to meet with these guys for a month, but I really like what they're doing. I've done a video conference with them or a phone conference. Would you meet them and tell me what you think? And we were like, sure, happy to do it. So we started doing that. At some point after the Brontes exit, we all started co-investing together. Micah, David, Chris Dixon, myself. We'd start pooling capital. Most of the money was still David's. He was writing much bigger checks than the rest of us. But we'd put some money together and we'd invest together. We ended up investing together 13 companies. Um, 2009, beginning of 2009, I was phasing out of, uh, was sort of late 2008, in the middle of financial crisis, phasing out of Brontes and 3M, um, talking to some of my former VCs about joining them. Um, and David, I went to South Africa with my wife, who's South African as well. And, um, and it, it was her first trip back since she had left many years when she went to college. And we spent time with the Frankels. And David talked about considering coming to the U.S. to start a fund, and would I do that with him? He knew I was talking to some venture funds. And I thought he was kind of crazy, and um, for a bunch of reasons, didn't think it made a lot of sense. Um, but the more we talked about it, the more excited I got. And I looked at his track record very closely, because I'd been looking at these funds that were considered top-tier funds. They told me they were top quartile. I looked at their numbers. They were 2004-type vintage funds, a lot like what David had been doing. And they were, you know, up 12%, 14%. Not not really impressive numbers. And I, you know, took a look at David's numbers. I sort of, he didn't have it all that organized. I had to put together a spreadsheet and really do the IRR analysis. And he was up over 50%. And we spent a lot of time trying to understand that. You know, it wasn't one lucky company. It wasn't some single outsized win. It was a whole bunch of things that had gone very well. And what we ultimately came up with was, and could have been wrong, might still be wrong, although it was seven years ago, and I think we've been... Um, doing a decent job validating this hypothesis, but he was doing some key things that the venture industry wasn't doing. He was investing at a very early stage. He was way more aligned to founders, so he was really first choice capital for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, his network among founders was excellent, and he found some great ways to maintain that, so he was using his founder connections to get to new founders. Which, it's not to say that every VC fund doesn't do that, but he was doing it in a particularly elegant way. Um, but the biggest thing was alignment. And as we looked at it, we really believed we could create an institution, a small one, it's always going to have to be a small one, that maintained a level of founder alignment that typical venture capital doesn't. Ultimately, if you're a life cycle investor, you're always a buyer when the entrepreneur is a seller of their stock. It creates a natural misalignment that caused me, for example, to be going out of my way to prove to my investors that they weren't crazy to keep investing in my company. What David did very well is he put money in at the beginning, and then he became an advocate for the company, but diluted alongside the founders. And that created a really, really powerful dynamic for us, or for him initially, and then ultimately for the fund we founded. So we founded a fund to be the most aligned fund to founders at the seed stage, structurally. Everyone at the fund is a founder. We think that's very important to founders. Um, and we think we have an economic model that ties ourselves much more to entrepreneurs in a way that also drives much better returns. Awesome. Yeah. I think we got a battery. So let five-second TV timeout. Hold up. Yep. Um, so, you know, I think this will be kind of an interesting dialogue because one of the things that you guys fundamentally shifted, and I think you guys were at a point when this was starting to happen already in the industry, but was shifting kind of the terminology of where different funds play, right? So there used to be the traditional model where you have your seed investors, friends, family, then C, then A, then B, then C. Each progressive stage kind of was a different investor class, right, with a very different mentality. Some people followed on, but not in a very defined way. Can you maybe help? define for some of the folks here the difference of how that ecosystem actually shifted and how you guys see your focus on that super seed stage now and, and, and kind of how that, that ecosystem has shifted around you as more people start to come back into your space. Yeah, I always think it's hard to look back at history and remember how it was. I don't, I don't know why that is um, so hard, but it always seems hard to me. I don't, I don't know about other people. So in 2009, when we started this fund, there were very few seed funds. Right, there were 
you know, 30 funds that were in the country that were characterized as seed funds. And many of those, not, not all of them, there were some great ones, but many of those were simply smaller funds that weren't able to raise larger funds. They, they weren't deliberately seed funds. They just, they, maybe it was their first fund and they raised $20 million hoping their next fund would be $200 million. But they weren't dedicated to seeds. So I don't know how many dedicated seed funds there were, but established dedicated seed funds were probably 10 in the country. Um, Today, there are 300. So things have changed a lot in that period of time, right? But what I would say back then is seed really was not readily available unless you were going to a large fund and you convinced them to write a small check to you, which instantly has some interesting conflict issues, which is they're not committed enough that it's hard for them to walk away from the company. But um, if they do walk away, nobody else is ever going to fund you because they're a large fund. Why aren't they writing the next check? They must know something that not everybody else knows. We call that the signal effect. And that, that's, a lot of people have tried to dispel that, but we just see it over and over again in the industry. We have a big portfolio. It's a very real phenomenon, right? And so I, there just weren't a lot of great options back then for early stage entrepreneurs unless they could convince VCs, larger VCs, that they probably wanted to write big checks over time and they were starting small, which again had this big interesting challenge. So the argument I would make, and I blogged about this, is the whole venture funnel used to be this very, very thin and long funnel where there was, it, there was, a, there was a, a taper to it, right? Some companies did fall off. But every commitment that a VC made was this like implicit 10 to $20 million commitment starting with two or $3 million. But very few companies got into that tunnel. Once they did, or in that pipeline, once they did, they were generally in it. Maybe they'd hit this misalignment issue if they fell out of alignment early. But those checks were so few and far between, that wasn't even really a big part of the mass of what was going on. So you either got that three to $5 million Series A, in which case you were almost definitely gonna get more capital and you're gonna move through that funnel, which I would argue is actually a pretty bad model both for entrepreneurs and for VCs. Right, because your bad companies you kind of keep spending money on also, right? It just wasn't, it, it wasn't a great model for anybody. It was hard to get in the pipe. If you got in and you were an entrepreneur, there was some good, some bad. You're a little captive. It was hard to create a market for your equity. You might have lower valuations. And what's happened with all of these super angels, accelerators, seed shops, is that the top of the funnel is just widened massively, right, in terms of who gets access to capital. Now, you still have to get into that thinner pipe at some point, right, in order to get more capital if you need it. But there's many more companies getting a chance to prove themselves than ever got to before. So it used to be a lot of people would say things about founders. They'd say, yeah, it's fundable. I just don't really love it. Mm -hmm. And those founders who really were fundable would just sit out there struggling like crazy to figure out how to get to a point where they were fundable. Now those founders, a lot of those get half a million to two to three million dollars right out of the gate get to prove some things, and then they're obviously much more fundable. So I would even argue that today, some of the companies that are probably some of the best companies out there might never have gotten a start if not for the, the top of the funnel opening like crazy. When, and certainly I think part of what happens too when you have that super verticalized funnel, right, is you tend to have a little bit more bad money chase or good money chasing bad phenomenon right so one of the the key factors that lends into any of this is obviously where the lps or limited partners decide to place their money and so for this whole seed world to start existing in a meaningful way you had to see a shift of that financial stream going from some of these later stage to earlier yeah. stage um and part of that was obviously precipit you know precipitated by 2001 some of the crashes some of the the poor fund returns that you're seeing on these more safe later stage companies that people thought they had better valuations on, which is yeah, and, and you nailed it. I mean, it looked exactly like that. So I don't, I don't have that much to add to it, but there was a lot of risk aversion among the limited partner base, the people who fund venture shops, and so it took a little time for that to, to shift. And this sort of growing period of, you know, um, excitement, bubble frothiness, whatever you want to call it, has certainly shifted those dollars. I would say in general, limited partners sort of trail the market. They don't lead the market. And so now that things have gotten exciting, now that Snapchat can be born and in three years be worth billions of dollars, it, it starts to get limited partners saying, I need to be in these really early stage funds. And unfortunately, the implication of that is maybe too many of them have been created. And the other implication of that is some of them have just raised more money than they ever should have. And yeah. so we've stayed very committed to being a small fund, but it's hard, right? Because you have all these people who are very eager to give you money, you start rationalizing, well, maybe we could work with a fund that's three times the size. 
And we, we've sort of said at some point, you know what, like, we, we don't need to rationalize this. Let's focus on being who we are. So talk about kind of your own investment thesis then. Uh, the, the first fund was a $40 million fund. You guys are a few million dollars larger now, but it's actually relatively focused, as you said. What is your investment thesis? How do you stage out your investment? Follow on, no follow on, focus on, on certain type of entrepreneur, certain type yep. of deal flow? So a lot of vectors there. So so first one was actually 50, second was 75. The third one's going to be 75 too. So we're we're pretty much set at where we want to be at $75 million. Whereas um, the old ones were all billion dollar funds, right? So totally they're different. Billion dollar funds, they're also peers of ours who are now doing $170 million funds, right? And we think it's fundamentally a different business. You have to decide you're changing your business model, which we don't, we don't want to, right? So we're trying to be very disciplined about doing what we do. What do we do? We write lead checks and we're also active participants so you know some of our most famous things that we've been involved in we were participants and from our view that's great because you know we're a participant in uber we're a participant in cruise automation most of these opportunities that we participate in reflect this belief that we have that when the only deals you can do in venture capital are the ones you can lead you have enormous adverse selection Right? We get invited to see a much broader set of opportunities, many of which somebody's already leading. Um, and we get invited in because people think we can help and we think, they think we're good advocates for the founders. And our peer group across the portfolio will bring value. And that, that's great for us. And we, we see that as very valuable to what we do. So we typically write two hundred dollars to $400,000 checks when we're participants. Somebody's usually leading that we respect. We don't join the board. We, we, actually, our model is to say, if we do our job right, we will be your favorite uncle. Right? Your favorite uncle, you call them when you want something, but you, they don't get upset that you don't call. They, you know, if you don't get around to calling them for a while, no sweat. If you call for advice and you hate the advice and you don't follow it, no problem. You like the advice, you want to call again tomorrow, happy to talk some more. That's the role we try to play with those companies. We also lead about a quarter of our investments. When we lead, we write much bigger checks, so our portfolio is actually much more concentrated than it seems. We typically write one to two million dollar checks when we lead an investment. And we do join the boards of those investments, and we become, in most cases, the most um, uh, aligned uh, advocate from the financial side for those companies. So, and we're very proud of that role, uh, which we like to play. So then the other part of your question is, what do we like to invest in? Um, when I, I, before that, how many yeah. companies total per fund would you say now? So, so fund two will ultimately have, I think, about 80 companies, um, about 25 that we lead, and then the others will be where we participated. So average just around a million dollars, a little under a million dollars per company, it, it, but very spread out. You can, of course, average, but it's, it's a little misleading to average, yeah. right? We'll have, you know three quarters of the portfolio that the average check is $350,000 and a quarter a quarter of the portfolio where the average check is probably $1.3 million. Yeah. All right. So sector focus, follow yep. on rounds. So we do digitally enabling technologies and we do them across, I mean, very, very broadly. So we've got a company we're wild about that we think is game changing in the user experience of wine. So, you know, just give you an idea of something pretty out there that is a digitally transformed experience, although it's also physical, right? So we definitely do a lot of hardware. Uh, we, you know, Cruise was a good example of a hardware company we're in. Um, Whoop here in Boston is a great example of a hardware company we're in. So we have a range of hard MakerBot, obviously, Form Labs here in Boston, Desktop Metal, those are all sort of related because they touch the 3D space. But, um, so we do hardware too, but digitally enabled technologies, right? Like, almost think of it as if software engineers are the enabling talent of, of the startup, there's a chance we could, it could be a fit for us. We want to believe it can become a really big company. We want to believe it can become extremely di um, differentiated in, in its space. Um, we are really non-thematic. So we never say things like, look, drones are going to be huge. We've got to go do a drone investment. Or Bitcoin's going to be big. Let's go focus on Bitcoin. We focus on what we think are off-the-charts founders, so people we meet and we're just like, whoa, we've got to be in business with this person. Um, working, what qualifies as off-the-charts? You know, it's really hard to um, nail it exactly, but here's the best advice I would give. Great customer development work. So too many founders think a company is about an idea. That is a huge failure mode for us. We don't think companies are at all about ideas. We think companies are about many ideas and lots of execution. And so when you get too fixated on something static like an idea, th that's very undermining for us of 
what you're doing to build a great company. What we want to understand is how did you go vet that idea? And how are you validating the idea? And what tests are you doing? And how are you putting resources around that idea? And what changes have you made to the idea as you started doing all of that customer development work? Because we never think it's some like Eureka in a bathtub type thing that drives a great startup. Even if you think about many of the great startups of our time, I think there's a little myth of the idea, like, oh, geez, you know, like, Dropbox was such an amazing idea. I mean, I went to Dartmouth in the late 90s, or mid 90s. FTP had already been around. Fetch, anyone remember Fetch? Had already been around for like, I don't know, like two decades, right? It is the same thing as Dropbox, arguably, but a totally different user experience that they had refined into a whole different sort of way of thinking about it that goes beyond just sort of like storage. Right, um, Airbnb was not the first company to try to build marketplaces for um, for excess inventory in housing. Right, um, Uber was not the first company to try to do ina mobile enabled transportation. Right, so it's not so much about the idea; it's about what are you doing to put that idea in motion to drive it. We're looking for like it's moving already. You're you're creating something that's really moving because we need to know that to build an outsized company, an entrepreneur can really work fast and they know where they want to go and they know what they want to do. So how do we say, you know, great entrepreneurs? We describe it as they're all over it. So then I've got to ask the $60 billion question because this is one of my five favorite conversations. We were hanging out in Nantucket, having lunch, your phone starts ringing. All of a sudden I see the goofiest smile come over Eric's face as he's looking over his phone and sure enough, Uber had just announced their $12 billion round. Obviously, they've done well. We've seen another 5x on valuation growth since then. What was it that you saw in that deal that you said, this is, this is going to be the biggest home run? Or did it look like everything else that you guys were already seeing? Yeah, and we were at the Nantucket conference. I don't want to make it sound like two of us were always in Nantucket. But, um, <laughs> Every it's, single it's weekend, with it, the flight's waiting for us right after that. Um, so there's a really good conference that Scott Kersner hosts every year in Nantucket, and, and we've been lucky enough to be there twice together, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, so the question was what I saw in Uber. Yeah. Uber um, versus, I mean, obviously you guys take a huge portfolio, but Uber's one of the many. Did you have a feeling they were going to be? Yeah, so I think if you ask me what the, you know, if you look at the five companies we invested in before Uber and the five companies we invested in after Uber, in the moment to rank order them based on likelihood of success, I don't think I would have said Uber was number one, right? I, I think everything we invest in, we invest in because we think it could be an outsized success story. Otherwise, we wouldn't invest. Um, Uber had tons of challenges and tons of risks. Uh, and for the first year, and this is why I say like it's hard to tap yourself back into history and remember what it was like. For the first year we did Uber, nobody wanted to talk about physical bits to atoms sort of stuff. They were much more focused on G like when you think of the geo local theme, it was it was all about Foursquare. That was the hot company of the moment. And when I talk about Uber in the venture community, um, a lot of people would sort of smirk at me, VCs, and say, you know, there are thousands of grand transportation companies in the in, in the in the U.S. Just U.S. focused at the time. Any one of them could build a mobile app. Like, why is that an interesting company? And I think to appreciate why it's an interesting company, you've got to go back to what I said before about founders not getting fixated on an idea. Because the idea would be mobile-enabled ground transportation. They weren't the only ones working on that. It's not that hard to believe every single ground transportation company could build a mobile app. Like, but then you think about um, what the founders are telling you about what they're trying to do to make their business work. And you couldn't help talking to Ryan Graves. It wasn't Travis Kalanick at the time. Travis was a co-founder, but wasn't full-time. And you talked to Ryan Graves, and he was already on the ground. He was already running these cars. He was already learning like crazy about how to scale that. Um, and he had great insights on it. And you couldn't help leaving the conversation with Ryan saying, this guy's all over it. He's got a really, really interesting outlook on how to build this business. That's something we get excited about. Now it seems really sexy. But yeah, right. Now, now it seems very logical in hindsight, yeah. right? So you can always tell that one. But and you guys have had similar success in many other companies as well. I mean, you mentioned cruise automation, unbelievable exit in just two years, right? Yeah. So how do you continue to think about what are those key factors specifically besides the hustle that, that makes a great entrepreneur a great entrepreneur? You know, they definitely have a series of insights into what they're doing that are non obvious, that they're finding great ways to constantly validate. Um, so I've hit on some of this before, but some of it's also, you know, luck, like incredible luck, right? Like Kyle Voigt, 
who founded Cruise Automation and previously founded Twitch, which he also sold for almost a billion dollars, um, worked for us for two weeks as an intern when he was at MIT and we were at Brontes. And he came into Micah's office and um, said he was resigning and dropping out of school to start what at the time was called Justin TV. Anyone remember Justin TV? Twitch. But t Justin became Twitch. And in the meantime, he actually, they, the team also created something called Social Cam, which they sold to, I think it was Autodesk, for like $30 million. Um, and we really, like, we took our interns really seriously at Brontes, and we had done a lot of recruiting to get to Kyle, and he was a really smart mechanical engineer at MIT. We were really excited about this guy. And we just read him the riot act. You know, Kyle, you're such a moron for thinking of leaving. You could learn so much here. Starting a company is really hard. Um, you'll learn how to start a company here. Shouldn't drop out of school. You know, you're going to learn so much at MIT. We really fought to keep Kyle. And he walked out the door a little pissed at us. Um, but luckily, he stayed in touch. And, you know, we didn't fund Twitch because we weren't a venture fund when he was starting Justin TV and, and going through that process. But we stayed distantly in touch. And he wanted to do something insane, which was build a self-driving car company with a pretty limited amount of capital. Um, I wish I could say we invested the first time he came to us. We, we invested the second time he came to us. Not, not very many people invested the first time. Um, but he convinced, I mean, within three months, he had uh, an early stage autonomous vehicle on the road. So talk about somebody moving very quickly to demonstrate and prove their hypothesis. It wasn't perfect. It was far from perfect. But he had actually prototyped an early version of what he was doing in three months. And Gaurav Jain and our team happened to be in California. And I asked Gaurav if he would risk his own life and sign a waiver first that I didn't ask him to do it. No, but um, no, he was very happy to get in the car and check it out and, and, and you know, came back and reported you know, this was really exciting. And we decided to invest. So sometimes you just get really lucky. The main thing on that front is, um, and this gets back to the history thing in a way, we tend to underestimate the people around us to a certain degree, right? Um, talented people who do a great job working with you, it, some of those people will go on to do extraordinary things that you wouldn't necessarily imagine they would do. It's almost like you know them so well that you know all the reasons why they may not succeed also. And yet, so many of these people can go on to do incredible things. And if you spend your career surrounding yourself with people you think are better than you, you will end up surrounding yourself with a lot of people who will go on to do extraordinary things. And that, that will be, hopefully, helpful to you as well. It will help you go on to do extraordinary things. I mean, I think Kyle would, as amazing as what he's done is, he's so humble in talking about the quality of people who pulled him up along the way as well. So on that same front, are there any people you've known so well that you didn't invest in them, and now you kind of kick yourself for saying, wow, I, I wish I could see past the flaws that I, I knew in them. <laughs> oh, man. Um, what's that? Uh, I'm having trouble thinking of a single case of somebody, but I think it'd be fair to say that um, uh, that it's, it's inevitable that you will underestimate some of the great things. I think, yes, actually, there's an example of somebody who worked for us at Brontes who was exceptional at Brontes, but he went into an industry that I thought would be incredibly difficult. And I actually bet Micah a steak dinner that, um, that it just wasn't going to end up being a great outcome. And Micah just said, this guy's so good, he'll figure out a way to make it a great outcome. And um, he, you know, he sold his business a month ago and an ex really exceptional. We didn't have, neither of us had a chance to invest. He wasn't raising money. But it's a great example of, you know, I thought he was very talented, but to apply to that space, I just thought this is not a great opportunity for him to win. And he proved me absolutely wrong. So I think there are, there are, there are examples. Any other stories of kind of investor envy or, or disappointment for deals that you saw? I mean, yeah. Dropbox is a classic case. Facebook was one of those ones that everyone in, in Boston kind of yeah. kicks themselves for now. So, but So those kind of predate me. But I, I've made the mistake of when I've spent time looking at a business and then something else comes along, remembering that it wasn't the business I was really evaluating. It was the entrepreneur. And thinking, I've already spent time learning this business and I didn't decide to invest. So why would I invest now? And I can think of two companies that have become billion-plus valuation companies that I was way too dismissive of because I had spent time looking at similar companies that, frankly, turned out to not work out. But the distinction was the quality of the entrepreneurs. It's another great example of it's not really about the idea, right? It, you know, I, I once blogged this blog, you know, the idea myth, just talking about I bought a, a laptop on auction on the internet in 1993, 94. So that predates eBay. eBay didn't exist. But these guys thought, you know, 
the internet could be huge for auctions. And they were like, okay, I'm just imagining their thought process. Okay, if we're going to do auctions on the internet, what's the most obvious thing to auction? Well, the internet's just techies right now. Nobody uses the internet except for techies. So what do techies want? Well, they want computers. Well, computers are more commoditized now than they were back then. But like back then, it was like, it was less commoditized. It was more differentiated. They were expensive, more expensive and... Um, I think they were right. I think they picked, like, in that sense, a great vertical. And then they said, well, how are we going to get people to trust each other? And they said, well, geez, nobody's going to trust each other selling computers to each other. So we'll take the computers in and we'll refurb them and guarantee them for 90 days and then ship them out. That's pretty logical, right? It was a great way to create trust. And by doing all those things, they completely missed the market, right? They... You know, eBay came out with a trust system that was way lighter weight than taking in merchandise and revamping it that you could never really recover your costs fully for um, by just, you know, creating a digital trust system. Um, turned out buying computers was actually a way less frequent use case than buying collectibles. So it was Pez dispensers ended up beating computers. So what, you know, who had the great idea, right? Well, the, the, the guys I bought the computer from, whose name I don't remember anymore, they had the great idea. But, you know, it's ideas. Ideas are really cheap. And there's always that theory, right, that if, if you have an idea, someone else has already done that, or 200 people have already done that. So, Which I think isn't about dismissing um, pursuing that idea as sort of something that's important to you that you want to pursue, or more specifically, a well, it's problem It's almost you probably want to counter, solve. right? You're almost saying exactly the opposite. Just what, because someone's done it before doesn't mean it's not a valuable time to enter that market. Especially if you have a very interesting hypothesis on how to solve that problem that you feel like is underserved right now. So do you laugh off kind of first mover advantage then at this point? Is that kind of a, a joke based on that investment thesis? Uh, you know, I think first, I think there's a lot of stuff VCs talk about that after the fact make a lot of sense. So for example, VCs love platforms because they look at the huge companies and those companies have become platforms. So they want to birth you as a platform. I've never seen a company, I don't say never, almost never are great companies birthed as platforms. They're birthed as use cases. And as they grow, they, they get the permission to become a platform, right? But, but people like to look at things after the fact, right? So I think this is another case where VCs look at first mover and they look at these extraordinary winners. So they say, well, look at Amazon, way out ahead. You know, you're never going to be able to compete with that. But they look at it three years in, or five years in, or 15 years in. They don't realize that Amazon wasn't the first people to sell books on the internet. So they weren't the first mover in that market. But for sure, you know, when something gets out to some massively huge lead, it is more diff and has a lot of, can attract a lot of capital, it is more difficult to compete with them. Excellent. Switching gears a little bit, I mean, we've obviously learned about your fund, your history. For everyone here who's on the audience, it'd be great to kind of talk about what, what type of advice do you have for people who are looking for funding today? You know, we see this proliferation of seed capital, but obviously going from seed to A is a totally different world. How do you think about that first round, second round? Should you be coming in with an exit plan already in place, or should you just be trying to test out that market? Yeah, I'm, le I'm less interested in your exit plan. Um, in fact, that slide I wish nobody ever showed me. Um, I just think we don't know what your company is going to come yet, so spending time talking about the exit is kind of silly. Um, I would say from day one, commit yourself to efficient entrepreneurship. There's nothing that costs entrepreneurs more than overfinancing their companies, getting caught up with how important it is to maximize valuation and mount raised at every turn. Because ultimately what that does is it, 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 it inevitably correlates to burn rate. And it's okay to have a big burn rate where, where you're using capital to scale something you've proven that works. But whenever you have a big burn rate um, to try to figure out something that works, you will usually destroy your whole business. And if you want to look at things like Quirky and Fab, and you know, there's this great story of Fab, great story, terrible story, but like it, it, great in terms of being um, incredibly uh, useful example, where they went from something like 12 million to 100 million in sales in a year, and it was considered a failure. VCs didn't want to keep funding it because they missed their plan meaningfully, right? Just imagine that going from 12 to 100 million in sales and you missed your plan so badly that people lost enthusiasm for funding you. It's, it's just a completely misfinanced company. And so I would say start by realizing that VC is not the thing that's going to make your business work or not work. It never is, right? It's the thing that allows you to lean in and scale against something you think is working. Or, or you're proving is working. You can accelerate against something that's working using capital. Think of it as a shot of adrenaline. You'd never want to run your life 
on shot of adrenaline to shot of adrenaline, right? But when something's really working for you, putting a shot of adrenaline against it is a pretty good idea. So I think what you want to do is avoid getting completely um, uh, dependent on that drug and avoid the mindset that if I only had money, we'd solve all of our problems. It doesn't work that way. It's foolish. It, it does not work that way. M money allows you to scale, right? It allows you to more aggressively go after things that are working, but it doesn't solve your problems. And, and the biggest problem is how it correlates to burn rate. No matter what, every single company, even when they say they're not going to in our portfolio, people we advise and respect, whatever capital they raise, no matter how big the number, it gets burnt in 12 to 24 months, always. And then there's a reconciliation between what their burn rate is and what investor enthusiasm is. And I have a ratio for this. I say, if you don't believe you're going to triple the valuation of your business in the next 24 months, I don't mean blindly believe it, but you have a roadmap that makes you very confident that you can triple your valuation in the next 24 months, then the amount of capital you're taking and the price you're taking it at is going to cause you problems because you're not going to satisfy that group of investors. And you're going to start justifying, I need to accelerate my burn, because otherwise I'll never be able to get to the growth numbers that are, are going to justify what these investors expect from me. And you've created an unnatural system that is going to hurt, injure, and destroy your company over time. So look at VC as something that can be very powerful, but only in terms of rocket boosters, not in terms of, boy, if I just had this money, I could just solve this problem, and then We'd figure X, Y. One of our sayings is use venture capital um, to scale things, uh, problems you've already solved, not to figure out what problem or how to solve a problem. Right? Um, so that, that's one piece of advice. I'm not sure if I addressed the original question. No, no, that, that's a great piece of yeah. advice. Um, second piece, I guess, and this is shifting completely differently, right, is we've been talking about kind of the founder persona, what it looks like to make someone invest of all. One of the pieces you can always do before the funding kicks in is think about who your co-founders are and what yeah. your team looks like. How do you guys think about the evaluation of the rest of the team and how should these guys be thinking about building out the right people? You talked about with Founder Collective, Brontes, yeah. so, fundamental, right? So I think most engineers I know underestimate the importance of being able to sell. They look at salespeople as slimy, insincere, um, uh, sort of the kind of people they don't want to associate themselves with. And I think that's because they're mostly interacting with bad salespeople. Actually, the world is filled mostly with pretty terrible salespeople. Um, good salespeople are great at articulating the value of whatever it is they're selling. They're incredible at it. And not in a way that is ever insincere. It's actually quite sincere. But engineers tend to look at stuff as facts, right? They look at it as, I'm doing ABC, therefore it should be fundable. And that's not how people invest. It's an emotional decision. It's not a fact-based decision. So it, it needs to have somebody who is actually good, has the charisma and the ability to sincerely tell that story in an extremely compelling way. And so I've met many engineers who are incredible at that. And they should be telling, being the ones doing that work. But if you don't love doing that work, or you don't think you're great at doing that work, or ultimately you say, I think I'm really good at coding, but I think I'm, a, I'm not a terribly charismatic personality. I don't mean that again in that sort of slimy, kind of questionable way. I mean like in some of the best people you've ever met in terms of how uh, sincere but also articulate they are at getting across a point, getting across a story. Those people are gold. They're hard to find. If you don't have that on your team, you're almost always going to need it. Right? Otherwise, the burden of what you need to prove from a facts-based standpoint is enormous. So I'll give you an example. The O-Power founders, especially Alex Lasky, is an extraordinary storyteller. If you're curious to see him, he did a great TED Talk. Um, you can look it up, O-Power, Alex Lasky. Watch him on TED. Is he the best storyteller in the world? No, that's probably Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or whomever. But Alex is a great storyteller. What O-Power did is they sent energy reports to people's homes to help them conserve electricity. Now imagine the engineer telling that story who's not a great storyteller. What we do is we print reports, we try to sell those to utilities to send to people's homes, and we hope that they will spend less on electricity because they receive these reports. It's a totally uncompelling, un you know, it's a, I used to joke that O-Power is Dan and Alex, you know, um, printing company. They print reports, that's what they do, right? It's like totally uncompelling. They, they were able to raise tens of millions of dollars, rightfully, like actually very efficient entrepreneurship in the way they built the company, because Alex was able to articulate why that was so powerful 
um, in terms of both the mandate utilities had around energy conservation and the environmental impact and double bottom line value of the company. They were also able to attract great talent to the company. And a lot of the job of a great founder is not just building good product, although I think that's very important. A lot of it is attracting resources. If you ask me what I think is the definition of an entrepreneur, it's being able to attract resources in a way that I still would say is sincere because there are shysters out there. You know, in my view, one of them is running for president right now. But there are shysters out there who they just, they just make shit up every day, right? And they just like, you don't want to be working with those types of people. Please don't vote for them either. But, um, and there are people who fancy themselves entrepreneurs who really are scam artists, and I would be very careful not to work with those types of people. But you need to be good at garnering resources towards your mission, right? And if you're not good at that, you won't succeed, right? It's just too, or, or another way to put it is the burden on, of proof on you when you're taking a totally fact-based approach to, you know, I've done A, B, and C, and therefore somebody should fund me, that A, B, and C is going to have to be off the charts, right? But when you can articulate well a good salesperson, uh, and I don't mean a salesperson like you're going to go hire a guy who just does door-to-door -door sales. I mean somebody who can be the evangelist, the advocate, the visionary for your business. If that's not you, you need somebody. Don't let your business be too limited. You have to build great teams. Companies don't succeed. Great companies never happen without great teams. So if you're going to build a great team, don't let, understand you're going to have to give something up to do that. You're going to have to give up control. To some degree, you're going to have to give up economics to some degree. Otherwise, you can't build a great team. But if you're going to build a great team, make sure you're instantly compensating or, or, or creating complementary skill sets to your own to the success of the business. So do we love entrepreneur, uh, engineers who, who are CEOs of their company? Absolutely. But they've got to be able to be great advocates for their business. So hopefully that's a sort of helpful mindset. Um, and I don't mean to broadly cast engineers. I just think it's a... Um, even in our portfolio, it's a classic fault, is being just way too, you know, the facts are all lined up, somebody should want to invest in us. And it's just never as simple as that. So I, th I think you had two really interesting points there, right? <clears throat> Founders continue to kind of mess up, not knowing their own weaknesses, and two, they sometimes mess up actually hiring shysters into their team, to use your, your New York terminology. Yeah. What other things do founders continue to do that when you come in, they pitch you, you just go, you've got to be joking me, this is coming again, whether it's on their pitch or, or kind of the way they've thought about it and grown their own company? I, I mean, I, I would go back to the customer development process. Like, if you haven't read Steve Blank, read Steve Blank. If you ever read Eric Reese, read Eric Reese. I think these are really, really good guidelines on how to think about getting from idea to business. Because I, I think you never want to go in pitching somebody an idea. I think that's a very weak pitch. But it's amazing, you know, in a pitch, I try to sit there sharing what I'm struggling with. Quick question. Yeah. So if someone comes in to you for an idea not to pitch you, but just to get your feedback, will you take those meetings? I, I think it depends who the person is. Yeah. And if, they, if it's somebody I know and respect, or I have a reason to believe that they're going to do the process well, yeah, I'm totally open to sort of kicking around ideas. But for the average person I don't know, and I have no reason, the, my only way to actually evaluate anybody I don't know as an entrepreneur is, one, if you can get a great referral into me from somebody I know, that's very helpful. Otherwise, the content of your story and the work you did to understand your business and validate it is the best thing I have. It's sort of like saying, you know, how do you decide whether to give somebody a PhD at an academic institution? You know, do you do it just like kicking around the idea of something they might want to study, or do you do a thesis defense? Right? And that person should be so deep on their subject matter that they should be able to stand up in front of you and get into a really good dialogue about their research and why their research, they chose the method they did and why they thought it was important and what the results were and what. And so my best way of understanding you as a person, if you're pitching me, is how deep are you on your business? Right? Um, we can always talk politics, but you know, that's a lot less uh, insightful to me about how deep you are in your business, right? And maybe causes me to have the wrong biases. But um, I want to understand how deep you are in your business, and I, I think that's critical. Awesome. So one last question, then we'll kind of jump to the conversation about Boston. One of the fundamental pieces you're talking about is these long-term relationships that you've established and that you've kind of built around yourself, that you've built with your founders, that the teams have found fundamentally built. How do people, or how should people here be thinking about their mentors, the relationships of, of people who can guide their thoughts and their, their entrepreneurship? What, what should that relationship look like and how should they start approaching and maintaining those relationships now? If you're doing ambitious things, 
in your world, whether it's already in, a, in an existing business or in a business you want to start. Talented people related to that world should appreciate what you're doing because it's ambitious. And you have to use your charisma to build relationships, genuine, non-transactional relationships with those people. And they should want to help you if you do a good job creating those relationships. Sometimes people are overbearing or they're annoying or they're too uh, uh, assuming and those kill, that kills those relationships. And I would say all of those things are, frankly, examples of being too transactional. Right? You want to build genuine relationships with people who can really help you over time. But I would say, you know, sort of the, the best advice I have career-wise, whether you're starting a business right now or you might want to in the future, even if you never want to, but you're thinking about your career, is measure yourself by things you're learning. Push yourself to be on the cutting edge of whatever it is you're working on. Too many people are just satisfied for their boss to be happy with the work they're doing as opposed to really trying to figure it out to what it is to be at the very best at what they're doing. And I mean, whatever it is, like even if you're a janitor or you're a assistant or you're a, it doesn't have to be, you know, like rocket science, whatever it is you're working on, push yourself to be the very best in the world. You know, try to figure out what, what is being on the cutting edge of that. And then try to get yourself around the best people that you can. So you go to a startup, a lot of people spend a lot of time worrying about, you know, um, is this startup gonna succeed? And I would say it's really hard to tell, right? As somebody coming into an early stage startup, it's super hard to tell. I would worry most about what's the quality of the people that I'm, being, that I'm talking to? Do I, I think these people are excellent or not? And then there's one other thing. There are people who are so cynical in this world that they think everyone's a loser. They just have that mindset. And I would say if you don't know who Going you admire. Going back to your political yeah, viewpoint right ex here. Exactly. If you don't know who you admire, ask yourself why. Ask yourself, ask yourself if you're not being open-minded enough about what real talent is and somehow inflating yourself in ways that doesn't recognize the core talents and capabilities and um, amazing aspects of the people around you. Or maybe if you're in an environment that you really don't feel that way about, get yourself into an environment where you really do feel because maybe you are just in a bad environment. But the key thing is surround yourself with great people, measure yourself by what you're learning and any way that like, you look at it, to me that's great career advice, but for the startup world, that means you're starting to build networks that can help you build great businesses. Awesome, so switching gears, part of the reason I was excited to take this conversation is because you've continued to prove yourself, besides an effective VC, as really a champion for Boston and, and really helping make this community a better place, whether it's politically or socially. I'd be interested, as we kind of start to have that conversation, as someone who invests in Boston, San Francisco, New York, and other locations, but those three primarily, what are the advantages and disadvantages, in your opinion, of someone starting a company here in Boston? Yeah, so, so I think Boston gets most often compared to Silicon Valley. And I think that's actually a pretty big compliment to Boston, even though often we beat ourselves up because we're not Silicon Valley. And maybe at one time, I wasn't here, the 128 loop and, and uh, deck, and we were the you know equivalent to Silicon Valley. We're not, and we haven't been for a long time. And I don't think that means you should all pick up and leave town. I actually think there are lots of reasons why this could be considered the best place to start a company. But let's start with why it isn't, right? Um, there, isn't, there just isn't the most um, collision of uh, people who know the startup ecosystem, know how to build companies, um, capital, talent, mentorship that there is in the Valley. The Valley is bigger in terms of the number of people who do this. We actually have a much more interesting, diverse community. If you go into any coffee shop in town here, people will be debating philosophy, they'll be debating biophysics, they'll be debating whatever it is, right? But if you... If you um, if you go into Silicon Valley, everyone there, all they want to talk about is the startup they're working on. So I think that actually is a benefit here, but it has a negative side to it. Why would Boston be the best place in the world to start a company? Um, I think the talent is disproportionate to the, to the um, capital in the ecosystem, which is a very powerful thing because when capital out, outstrips talent, you have massive price wars for talent, you have lack of loyalty, you have people jumping every day. It's really hard to build a business when you're building a good business and 30% of your workforce turns over every year. It's really, really hard. You have no continuity. It's hard to keep projects moving along. It's just not true in Boston, right? There's enormous loyalty. People stick around. There's tremendous talent in this ecosystem. Um, but, but let's talk about talent because my thing is I, I have a whole bunch of things I've been really working hard on over the last few years that I think speak to some of our opportunities and challenges in Boston. The first one is celebrating success. 
So I think Boston celebrates success very, very badly, right? Wayfair is a much more successful company than Zappos. How many people in California know what Wayfair is? How many people would agree that Wayfair is a more successful company than Zappos in the Bay Area? You wouldn't get anybody to agree with that. But economically, there's no way you could argue that Wayfair is not a much more successful business than Zappos. It's a much more successful business than Warby. Warby's a really exciting company in New York. But Warby's built a big brand, they've got a megaphone of New York media, and they get a lot of attention. And Wayfair has quietly built their business brick by brick over time. I mean, even on that front, right? Most people here probably had no clue Wayfair is a 12-year-old company, right? It only came on the scene really three years ago, let's say, but it's been here forever. And it's rebranding. Re yeah, CSN and everything. So else. another great example, I did an event with Chad Lawrence of Simply Safe. Simply Safe could arguably be the best Internet of Things company in the United States right now. I don't have exact numbers on that. I think they're doing somewhere around 200 million sales. I think it's more than Nest was when they sold Nest. I don't think there's any other IoT startup that has done nearly as well as that. Nobody talks about it, right? So I think one thing we do very badly here is celebrate success. So I think the Nevi Awards hosted by the New England Venture Capital Association, the MyTex Awards, the I do an event called Founder Dialogues, all of these things are to try to help us do a better job celebrating success. I think that's important. Two is the best talent in the world, not only do we have great talent who stays here, but the best talent in the world comes through Boston and then it leaves. Our universities attract globally unmatched talent, per, for, at least for the size of city that we have. Um, but we don't do anything to keep them here. And we let the consulting firms come in and sell them nonsense. And the sort of media buying firms and the PR firms and the, right? And they go into these schools and they do a great job recruiting and they take all of our talent and it goes to New York, goes to California, the investment banks. We've got to show a better path to our students. So I spearheaded this effort to start a group, uh, an organization called TechGen. Te uh, tech generation, through also through, in partnership with the New England Venture Capital Association. And at this point, I think the numbers are we had 3,000 students this year put their resumes on TechGen to apply for jobs in this tech community. Because our view is, if you get these students enmeshed in the community while they're in school, because most students, you go to them, they're at Harvard, studying computer science. Actually, better example, I gave a talk at Wellesley, right, to 30 computer science students at Wellesley. Now, given the lack of women in tech in Boston. This should have been the most like, obvious place in the world for tech, for tech companies in Boston to be recruiting. And these students had no idea either the names of our companies, which companies they should be interested in, um, or how to get jobs there. Nobody's talking to them. By the way, Andreessen Horowitz was there, right? They're, they're recruiting them to California. So TechGen's been really powerful. It's been very exciting to see 3,000 students in our second year in Boston looking for jobs. But here's the other side of that. If you're running a company here in Boston, a tech company, get on TechGen because we only have 200 companies on there and we need to build that side up as well. 200 is not bad, but we need more and more and more. We got to build this marketplace ecosystem so that we're keeping our talent, these students enmeshed here so they think, why would I ever leave? Because you spend a summer working at TripAdvisor or a small startup here in Boston, you might, stay, you might choose, that's what happened to me. Right? I, I spent the summer working for a tech company here in Boston, and I decided to stay in town and build Brontes here. Um, and that can be said for a lot of our anchor institutions, not just tech companies, but anchoring people in some sort of totally. first position here in Boston. And that goes to our branding position as well, right? If we don't make these companies sexy, attractive, fun, and accessible. When, when students say to me, but there's nothing going on in the Boston tech ecosystem, I gotta go to California, I'm like, Oh my God, you just don't know. Or when I go to New York and people, and this is the perception, I, we do a lot in New York. We have an office there. We're very active there. When I go to New York and people say, God, is there anything going on in tech in Boston? And I say, wow, you know, you should know every year two companies exit in Boston for more money than any company has ever exited for in New York. Every year. So no. There's no awareness of it. Now, New York's amazing. There's lots of great stuff going on. It's very exciting, evolving tech ecosystem. I'm, I'm very proud to be involved in New York. But, but you, I think you almost can't compare, right? And yet, and by the way, tech talent is so thin. It's so hard to find talent in New York City. We have such a rich, well, if you ask anyone in Boston, it's hard to recruit because it's always hard to recruit. But there's such richness in talent relative to the other ecosystems. So, okay, so w because of tech gen, I got involved in going to Beacon Hill and trying to get government support for this program. And that got me bit by the bug that there's things you can do, because I did, it was successful. Karen Spilka was incredibly helpful, who's uh, chairman of Ways and Means. And um, 
this tech talent pipeline got supported and funded, and you realize like you can actually get government support, right? There's change that can happen when it makes sense and it's rational for the state. And so policy has become sort of a third thing I'm very interested in. And we're working very hard right now on non-compete reform. So I don't know if you've been hearing about that in the press. That's why I wanted to start early because I thought we could spend a little time talking about because David's been very involved too. And then we're also trying, I've been leading with my wife who's an attorney at Demandware, which is a very uh, exceptional, just got bought by Salesforce, but exceptional Boston tech company story, right? It was bought for almost $3 billion, right? Again, bigger than any exit New York has ever had but it was bought by um, Salesforce a few weeks ago for almost $3 billion. Um, so she's in-house counsel there, and she's been a troll slayer for many years. She fights patent trolls. She does many other things. She's a broad-based GC, but, she, but this has been a passion area for her, and she started her career fighting um, patent trolls as a litigator. And so we're working on legislation that has been rolled out in other states, but we don't have it yet in Massachusetts, that actually allows, I don't know if people know about the scourge of patent trolls, but this is like a real problem, like major value extraction with no value creation except that the trolls get to extract the value. But it largely is an extortionary um, shakedown. So there are some more legitimate trolls who are very discriminating about how they sue and who they sue, and they own IP, and I'm not a big fan of any of that. but. We're not going after those people. We're going after the indiscriminate trolls who are really doing shakedowns. They're saying um, they send a patent letter. By the way, there are 100, over 100,000 of these letters go out a year. They send a letter basically to hundreds of people saying, you owe me money because you're violating my IP, and I'm going to sue you unless you want a license, and that license is $100,000. And that starts a negotiation. Let me give you an extreme on this. Coffee shops throughout the United States were sued by a patent troll because the troll claimed they had intellectual property coverage of anyone using Wi-Fi in a commercial space. Now imagine, I don't know what like a good coffee shop might gross a year, or net a year, I don't know, a few hundred thousand dollars. Imagine somebody runs a good coffee shop, maybe they're netting 50,000, I don't even know. They've gotta go find a patent litigator, right, to go help them figure out how to handle this troll. What do they do? They all settle, it's all just a shakedown. It literally is, you want your garbage hauled? Right? You're going to pay me an absurd amount of money. Otherwise, you know, your garbage will be left on the, on the stoop every day. Right? It, it is extortion. And, and so what we're trying to do is create a remedy whereby if somebody's practicing extortionary practices as a troll, you can actually sue them in state court because all these patent IP cases are all done in federal court. But you can sue them in state court and actually have a counterclaim because never before has, has a defendant been able to have a counterclaim. Right? And so there's legislation that's been put forth and is in front of our state senate right now that we are supporters of, that the, the um, chamber has supported, um, and we're hoping to see get into this legislative cycle, which is almost done, um, but uh, we have a handful of key people trying to get it amended to one of the key bills um, that is being discussed right now. So th those are a few things I'm very excited about. Yeah, and obviously this conversation is very important because if you look at the history of kind of tech in Boston, very rarely, and as you said, this is something relatively new to even you, has the VC community or has the tech community reached out to litigators or, or to the, the state senators until it's too late, right? We, we've seen the, this now with DraftKings, a, a homegrown company, did very well. They kind of got themselves in a little bit of hot water by going too fast in da daily fantasy sports. Yep. Now they're backpedaling and trying to figure out the system as they go. That's often the case we hear. You know, Uber obviously became a, a similar type of story. What's interesting here is we're learning, and you're learning, I think, very quickly, that there's a lot more appetite to be able to pay attention to what's happening in the innovation community. And so the change on the ground can not only be with what we do, but how we talk about it and who we're talking about it with. It's that cross-collaboration that makes it particularly powerful. I, and I, I would even go a step further and say the problem historically has been that government is against innovation. They don't say that. They don't want to be against innovation. But the reason they're against innovation is incumbents are being disrupted. And incumbents are the one usually best politically situated. So on this non-compete issue, EMC has been the biggest vocal tech company supporting non-competes and, and fighting against this legislation. EMC has 30 lobbyists on Beacon Hill. I think that's true. I, it may be, I but don't something know like that. Number, yeah, they have something like 30 lobbyists on, on, on Beacon Hill. It's not the up and coming innovators who have large lobbying organizations on Beacon Hill. If you look at Uber, I don't know, does anyone remember what um, legal grounds Cambridge tried to shut down Uber when they first arrived? Does anyone remember what the legal grounds was? Because I. Taxi token? Wasn't it, what do you mean by the token? 
huge tax cab driver needed, or the company. not not the medallion. That no. that actually wasn't the key thing. Does anyone remember? Because this is so I get this question all the time. But but Uber's kind of illegal. Like, how do you feel about them violating all these laws? And you know, it's very interesting. Like, illegal is extremely in the eye of the beholder. So I think the establishment has done a great job painting Uber that way. So let me give you a great example. When Uber came to Cambridge. The statute that Cambridge used to try to stop Uber was that the measurement of mileage by satellite was not a legitimate measurement of mileage. So there was statutes that said you needed to have a credible measurement of mileage and a meter in a, in a vehicle is a credible measurement of mileage. But a satellite, which by the way, we use to send autonomous drones to kill people <laughs> down to like half meter precision, one, I don't know, one foot, per, I don't know what it is, but like th that's what the US government uses satellites for, one of the many things, um, wasn't a credible measurement system by which to, so just understand, right, the establishment is trying to paint this constant um, fight against innovation as violating laws, breaking rules, and, and not say the establishment never has a credible argument, right? I, there are constraints in many cases the establishment has on them that have been put in place to not let them get too powerful over time, even though they've become very powerful, that often the innovators don't have to respond to. So there, there is a legitimate reason for that tension. But what I've learned is if we're not going to government and helping them understand what the needs, this is again advocacy, right? Selling the story, being a good salesperson for innovation and helping government understand what's important for having an amazing ecosystem. If nobody's doing that, government's just going to be swayed by established interests. So we, we have to fight that. And, and I would say government's much more, at least on our state level, much more open-minded than I ever imagined it would be. And I, I think this is a very interesting point, right? So the, the mix is obviously when you're an established company, you get to say, hey, we're protecting these jobs, and these are important things that we already have. And innovation gets to say, here are the jobs that we're creating, and here's the potential this offers. And mixing those two are really interesting tension that often the political advocates have to go back and forth and kind of consider, right? Which I mean, it's an interesting thing because, to be fair, there, the data, and I don't have this data readily in hand, but I've seen it over time. The data does not reflect that large companies create jobs. The data does not reflect that small companies create jobs. Largely jobs are being created by innovators in the ecosystem. Like that is what's driving most job growth. It's very rarely big companies. So um, you think that... Well, it's job stability, which is what I was saying, right? That's so, right. Yeah, and yeah. If, if tomorrow, you know, a major company left state, many jobs could be lost in that context too. So certainly government has to be co cognizant of that. Yes. Yep. So one of the other things that obviously is kind of interesting, and we're seeing this a lot from the Chamber's perspective, and this is particularly pointing to this conversation, and uh, we'll touch briefly maybe on non-competes and what that looks like, but, um, you know, at the Chamber, we work with a lot of later stage companies. We're starting to do a lot more with the entrepreneurial community. That was kind of why I came in. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that's a huge win. It's a great example. I mean, the Chamber has lots of political influence. Um, to the extent that they've hired somebody, you know, very capable, very connected, to work with the innovators in the community is a huge, it's a w huge win. Yeah, and we, you know, the the point of this is obviously what's interesting is if you look at a lot of the later stage companies, certain parties exempted, right? They actually have a lot of invested interest in the innovators, right? So they might not be creating these jobs, but that's acquisition targets, that's growth sure. targets, that's, and so a thriving economy actually lifts all boats when done correctly, except for maybe that one company, but if they, they're paying attention, they might actually be able to move quickly enough. So, you know, it's a, I think we're in a shifting demographic here in Boston, both because of what's happening in the political conversation, but because of this interest in interconnectivity, as many more things are becoming technologically focused, a lot of these same companies are fighting for the same talent that we're talking about. So this talent pipeline becomes a lot more interesting to them. A lot of the internet of things that they're looking at now sit on top of products that they already own. That's right. So they're becoming more interested in it. I, I think you're starting to see a much more defined I mean, just the whole idea pathway. of developer ecosystems yeah. being built on platforms of large companies, right? I mean, just the Amazon cloud, right, is a huge example of the importance of the innovators to the more established companies. So let's talk briefly then about non-competes, because this is kind of the other major legislative yep. thing. And, you know, your side, my side, we're slightly off in terms of where we're going, but yeah. this is going to be the first time. We have that like I think, some Venn overlap. Yeah, and, and, but I think yeah. this is the first time that Venn overlaps right. ever really existed. 
Uh, is everyone here actually familiar kind of with what the concept of non-competes are, what they're supposed to be doing, or is this new terminology? Anyone not know what it is? Should we do a very quick primer? You can do a quick one, yeah. Yeah, so, so the quick primer is at the point at which you decide that you would like to take a job at an employer, they are entitled today to put a non-compete in front of you that has no consideration outside of the job. And that non-compete has limits to how broad it can be, but it can be incredibly broad. Right, And frankly, the only way for you to know whether it's overly broad in terms of decision making is to actually challenge it in court, which most employees ultimately at one point, well, when they have their job, they would never do. And when they're looking for their next job, are terrified of doing, right? Imagine being an individual employee um, fighting a lawsuit against EMC, you know, a, a company worth tens of billions of dollars over, over your non-compete. And the problem with all of this is a fewfold. One is, it prevents innovation in the ecosystem because people with any domain expertise um, are, are constrained in their ability to go start a new business, even if it doesn't violate any of the trade secrets or key learnings from their previous employer, which, by the way, are still protected. They're very broadly written right now. Very broadly. V written as stands, right? The, as, so, as they stand. Yeah. So, so, so and, there's always the classic Jimmy John's case, let's say, as an example, right? So right now they broadly apply to the fact that someone who's creating sandwiches has proprietary access to what's going in that sandwich and they're short for shouldn't be able to work at Subway because they know Jimmy John's so, secrets. So this is the is, second key point, right? So it prevents some level of innovation. But the second key point is it really is punishing to employees, right? You're in a very vulnerable and weak position when you're negotiating for your job. And there are usually other things that are more important to you, like, first of all, getting the job, which is a bit of a bind. Binary. Second of all, salary and other key em uh, employment terms that matter to you, maybe vacation. Um, so you're not in a great position to negotiate this term that right now in this moment is not actually so important to you, but might be along the way. But it may truly prevent your future employment, right? If your greatest skill is making sandwiches, and that's what you've done, you've always worked in delis all your life, and then you go to work there and you sign a non-compete, you may never, you may not be allowed to go make sandwiches anywhere else, which is crazy. Or Believe it or not, camp, summer camps have non-competes that don't allow you to go be a camp counselor at any other camp. So it puts this enormous employment burden on the employee. It also creates artificially depressed wages in theory because it's a lot harder to go use your talents elsewhere. So you're going to stay at your current employer and they don't have as much reason to keep raising your salaries. That's probably a little less, it's probably a little, little too, more of a macro statement than a micro, you know, individual by individual statement. So the good news is, Non-compete reform has been introduced, and this has been really fought for by the venture community and certain other parties, although the large tech companies in Massachusetts have fought against it because they like having this power over employees. Well, and to be fair, I think it does, you see some small companies, some large companies on both sides, some are indifferent, some are interested, but there is, there are definitely varying perspectives depending on where you sit. Is, well, is, the more you're an incumbent, the more it's a collective action problem for you. And it can even be a small incumbent, right? Like DraftKings is not yet an old school institutional incumbent in town. But in truth, like, do they really want any of their employees going to some other daily fantasy sports company? Would they, it, does the benefit of being able to take people out of those companies outweigh the cost of losing people to those companies? And so I don't know what their position is specifically, but just using them as an example, they may say, you know what? We, we don't mind non-competes, we actually like the idea, right? Because it really is much more about the empowerment of the employee and the broader ecosystem than it is about an individual company that frankly wants to protect its assets, right? Which are its people and its proprietary information. And the burden of using other laws to protect proprietary information is higher. It's a lot harder for a company to use, even though there are protections, it's harder than just saying, no, you can't work. You were in cloud um, services, you can't work in any other cloud services business. It's a really easy way. It's a very blunt instrument for a company. So the legislation is out, mm -hmm. right? And it just passed just the passed House. Just passed the House, yep. So it's moving to the Senate now. Do you want to describe it? What the, the actual bill says? Yeah. yeah so the, the new bill, essentially, right? And this is interesting because historically, Massachusetts was very supportive of non-competes. Um, so if they were enforced, they were blindly enforced. California has gotten rid of non-competes actually in the 1850s. So they've been gone for a long time. Can't really attribute the start of the tech community there, but it, it certainly might help some of their mobility issues now. Well, I mean, some would say, yep. just, just to get specific yeah, some to that, that some would say that Intel never would have existed, right? I mean, it was born out of, am I going to get this right? It was born out of Fairchild. Um, 
Yeah, so, so they wouldn't have been able to create that company, right? So a lot of generational innovation where people left companies that became sort of more stodgy, more um, focused on scaling their products and focused on innovating. EMC is an amazing example. EMC is a sales company. They're not an innovator anymore, in my opinion, in our tech ecosystem. And yet, so somebody could be there having been frustrated by that and wanting to be in a place innovating, but they can't. Because if they try to go somewhere else and innovate in that market, a non-compete kicks in. Yeah, so the new legislation essentially is creating several different compromises, the primary of which is limiting the term of the, the non-compete, secondarily creating a consideration that would be attached to a non-compete that would have to be explicit. There's some discussion back and forth now in terms of what that consideration has to be, when it would have to come into place. Um, and it also will create, uh, sorry, the, the non-compete also limits low-wage workers from being exempt from these non-compete agreements. So well, the so Jimmy it, John's it, case or the... And if you've been terminated, yeah. right? So they can't enforce a non... Right today, they can terminate you and enforce a non-compete on you, right? You can't do that. The key provision that has me as a person who's focused on the innovation ecosystem here in Massachusetts supporting this bill, because I'd like to see the eradication of non-competes completely. But the key provision is what's called garden leave, and David referenced it. Um, the idea of garden leave is it's never free for an employer to um, enforce a non-compete. They have to decide at the time of your termination or decision to leave the company, whether not termination, because termination they can't enforce it. They have to decide when you've decided to leave the company, they have to make a decision in that moment whether or not they're going to enforce your non-compete. And if they are, they have to pay you, it's called garden leave, half your salary to go sit on the bench for a year. Right? I would prefer it to be all your salary, but they have to pay you. It's not free. Right? It's not just a free blunt instrument they can use. They can really only use it in places where they really truly believe that it is a risk to their business because otherwise nobody would pay. The, the challenge is, and this is where the Chamber and the, any, the New England Venture Capital Association are not totally on the same page, is at the very last moment that the bill was going in front of the House, a provision was added that said garden leave or some other agreed upon compensation. Now, some other agreed on compensation, as it's written today, could really just be, um, well, we gave you a $10,000 signing bonus anyway. We're going to describe your signing bonus as agreed upon compensation for any non-compete that we enforce in the future. And you know, my joke was, when I tweeted about it, that's a loophole so big you could drive EMC right through it, right? Which was the point. And I think now that it's going to the Senate, the question will be, will that survive or will that get closed? But I think from the tech community, the innovation side of the tech community's perspective, um, we're not going to be very satisfied with any solution that potentially has an out like that. It's either you commit to paying for garden leave because it's so important to you to enforce this non-compete, or you shouldn't be able to enforce a non-compete. Right. And so when, what we were starting to talk about before this even kicked off is to part of the original bill is really sloppy and that's part of what this provision, the provision I think is actually in better faith. I think more people are, are willing to kind of get this to where it needs to be. But what I, I think would be interesting and, and part of the reason for this dialogue and then we'll definitely open up to Q&A so you can get back to Eric's original kind of investor and startup world. Or we can talk about this. Yeah, yeah. whatever whatever works. Yeah. But so what, you know, what, what I think is particularly interesting is you're going to see this conversation come to the Senate very soon. And what hasn't happened before is a lot of activity from within the startup community to make sure that their voice is heard. So when this starts to come out, make sure that you guys see this as an opportunity to really be able to step up and express, regardless of which side. I mean, we again, there are small companies who are very supportive of the idea of non-compete, some who aren't, but make sure that you're part of this political process, because just like the election this year will actually really matter, because the chance that this goes through in any form next year is significantly diminished for a lot of political reasons versus, versus this year. This year. Yeah. I also want to compliment David for a moment, because, and this is why I say it's so important that the Chamber's created this role and put somebody like him in this role, um, the chamber represents people who are for non-competes and against non-competes. So it's very hard for the chamber to come up and say, we, are, we have a very specific view of what needs to happen here. But David has played a role in mediating that, you know, sort of helping the tech community understand what the arguments are on the other side, helping the other side understand what the arguments are in the tech community, helping his legislative team understand what, what the tech community is trying to accomplish with this. Um, and that's, that's really important to create understanding to move these types of processes forward. And it's why I'm, I'm so glad 
hopefully he stays in this role for some meaningful period of time. So as long as they keep me, who knows? Maybe once they see this video, I'll get in a lot of trouble. And there you go. Um, I, I thought you did a pretty good job towing the line. Yeah, so. hopefully. Um, so on that, why don't we open up to question and answer? Um, you know, I mean, anything's fair game here. Eric obviously is a good storyteller. So whatever, uh, whatever interests you guys, we'll we'll pass the mic around here. I think I put everybody to sleep with legislation. <laughs> Um, so this goes back to uh, Brontus. Uh, how did you go from imaging, 3D imaging, to dental imaging? So it's just very yeah. Process. And some people just say like, boy, you left so much value on the table because you could have been 3D for everything, which is where we started. I, I think at some point I mentioned we really concluded we wanted to be a solution to a problem, not to a real problem, not a solution looking for a problem. And we started off as a solution looking for a problem, and we actually explored 40 different industries, um, I would say at a pretty cursory level. Dismissed dentistry, by the way, uh, in the early go when we were looking at all these different opportunities, we just thought it was really more a patient comfort benefit. Who's ever had a dental impression? They, they make you gag, they taste pretty terrible, right? They're not a great experience, but we didn't think that would be enough motivation for dentists to change. So we dismissed it very quickly. What we didn't understand, it was all about the work product of the dentist, saving the dentist time, efficiency, quality, um, production costs. Um, and once we realized that, we got more excited about the industry. But it was a journey. It was a complicated, I mean, it's a little long story, but it was a complicated journey to find that market opportunity and also stop um, uh, misleading ourselves to believe that we could be 3D, a 3D platform for everything. I, I don't really believe in birthing platforms. I'm sorry, it's a follow-up question. So it's probably a mixture of both. Did you go like, top like, down or bottom up? Like, like, like. Did you go top down or bottom up? I'm sure it's a mixture of both, but. I think it really was a mixture of both. Uh, ultimately, you have to bottom up, right? Like you have to get deep into the use case with the users and be very bottom up about it. But we, we, we definitely did both. So yeah, so next question. Yeah, it's a completely different question. I, I am creating an ed tech company in Barcelona, Spain, and I am planning to move to Boston to create the company to f grow faster. Any advice why to have I to start my company here or to remain in Barcelona and when is the best for a startup to come to Boston to grow? So Barcelona is one of my two favorite cities I've ever been to. So you it's are hard. Always invited to come it's and visit us. It, it, it's unbelievable. So it's hard to imagine anyone leaving Barcelona to do anything. But but um yeah, I'm actually mad I didn't get an invite. Yeah, exactly. Can can David come to Barcelona? All invited, yeah. Okay, I have a big so, house for so, them. So um I, I, I think Boston's advantages, I don't know the Barcelona tech ecosystem that well, but I imagine we, we probably do 50 times the venture capital in Boston than is done in Barcelona. We probably have, in terms of high quality engineers who understand the startup process, orders of magnitude, more support. My best advice though is, unfortunately can be a bit of a provincial, provincial ecosystem. Right, or a better way to put it is, I think Boston's very tribal in its, in its personality. And I think in order to overcome that, you need to get somebody on your team who is part of the ecosystem and can navigate it. Because you know, it's when Jeff Seberg first came to Boston to open the box office, I, I met with him like the first week and I said, you're in a great place. You're gonna find finding talent here is so much easier. And nine months later he said to me, Jeff, I didn't find that at all. But then when he started Crashlytics, he found recruiting extremely easy. And I think the reason was he was working with people in Boston who had networks in Boston, right? It's people don't just jump for stock options or jump to the new hot thing. They're very loyal here, but they're also very loyal to people they've worked with before. So if you can bring if you're gonna come here, I would say team up on the on the talent recruitment side with with people who know this ecosystem, because I think it will help a lot. And if I if I could jump in real quick. One other note on that. Um, so just because we're starting to do this from the Chamber's perspective, there is a lot of companies specifically from Europe that see Boston as a launch location for their second uh, or market expansion. So to the degree that you can operate something that doesn't necessarily need venture capital, Barcelona might be a good place to start, but growth is specifically for US-based town. A lot of people who think about Boston as a second location get much more excited about that over, let's say, New York, because it's more manageable, and over San Francisco, because it's six hours back home versus 12 hours back home. So just a quick aside. So the question I, the question I have is, do you see companies like Pivotal part of this 
development ecosystem. So someone who cannot find those set of developers, do you see yourself getting a relationship with, Piv with a company like Pivotal? Okay, they have developers transforming how the world builds software, right? So, or does Pivotal see themselves as a way to work with the venture capitalist? Sort of that middle ground in between hiring your own versus having a team like that. I, I think it depends on what kind of startup you're building. If, in our thesis, software is the key driver, not the only driver, you gotta find channels, you gotta do a lot of different things, but ultimately the biggest vectors of value creation are in building software, not just statically because you need to build something once, but over time in an iterative fashion. It's really hard to do that without a dedicated team that's just yours, because you need that team of developers to every waking moment try to think about how do they make this better. And it's harder to do that when you're like starting with a specification, even if done in an agile, iterative way, the way um, Pivotal will do it. Having said that, lots of our companies use development shops for parts of the process, and Pivotal certainly is one of the better ones out there. Um, maybe mobile is a part but not the key to their strategy at the beginning, but they want to get a mobile app out. So they go find a good mobile development shop to help them get a first version of that mobile app uh, out. So I, I would think of um, outside resources from the lens of um, is this mission critical long term to our business or not, right? So the reason I would always recommend startups um, hire a good law firm rather than um, hire a lawyer is because it's not mission critical to the differentiation and value creation of that start. You need a good lawyer, but you can go get that service and, and, and if everyone else gets the same good lawyers, that's fine, right? But if it's where you're going to meaningfully differentiate yourself, ideally you'd like to have it in-house. But ideally, at the beginning, sometimes to get it off the ground, to get it moving, you'll take it outside. And, and I think that's part of being you know, resourceful in how you build your business. Especially when some of these folks will take some equity, it can make a very big impact. But I'd always rather be native. Ultimately, I'd rather be native. A little bit native. And yeah, and, and that's the other thing. You get a great CTO, they can often manage um, uh, less controlled resources well. Um, and that helps a lot too. Yeah. So I was really interested in your story about how even after you'd got funded, you felt like you were constantly re-explaining why dentistry was a great, a great, a great area to go in. So I, I relate to that a lot because I've spent about half my time talking with customers. We sell into the multifamily property management industry, um, and you know they just love what we're doing. And then I spend the other half of my time. It feels like trying to explain why that market is so exciting, uh, you know, to to potential investors. So, you know, what's the best way? You know, some hints on on, on yeah. how to improve so that. So the mistake process. I made, which I would recommend, not at that phase, but early on, was believing that what was obvious to me as the innovator should be in any way obvious to any investor in the world. It should not be obvious, right? If you're innovating, you're doing stuff that by its definition is stuff not everybody's doing. And it should be incredibly unobvious to every single financial party you pitch. You should start from the assumption that Th that if you literally lay out the facts, they should have no interest in investing. I don't mean make stuff up. I mean you need to take the validation that you're seeing in the market and figure out how to translate that back to these people so they understand what you're doing to validate your hypothesis and why this suggests it could be a really, really big company. But I would say like, you know, I, I always remember in Philadelphia, Denzel Washington said, explain it to me like I'm an idiot. idiot. You kind of need to explain it to every VC like they're an idiot because they're not in your space, right? And if they are, they probably have a conflict and they can't even invest in your company, right? Maybe they've done something relevant to your space before. But generally speaking, I would assume very little. And I would start from the entire burden is on you to explain why this is a world-changing company, both from a high-level perspective of great storytelling and from an on-the-ground perspective of what you're doing to prove that out. And if you do a great job doing that, you know, light bulbs should go off. If you got to practice like crazy, you know, it's like I have entrepreneurs in our portfolio whom I love, who I can't get to show up and practice a pitch with me. And it drives me crazy. You know, the President of the United States, before the President does a debate, Barack Obama is a pretty darn good speaker. He never does a debate without practicing. So if, if, if you're working on how to tell your story and get a point across, why you think you should just naturally just somehow be able to do that, but Barack Obama can't, right? I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I think you've got to step back and say, this is a, 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 this is a 
storytelling. I mean, the other example I give, and it's very relevant to this in a higher level way. People send me four page executive summaries, dense prose. I have no idea why they do this. And the analogy I give is, you're trying to capture my attention in a short period of time, unless you came in with an amazing referral, the last thing I'm gonna do is read four page of dense prose to decide whether or not I like your business, right? And the equivalent analogy I would say is, imagine doing a television commercial, where instead of doing anything to tell a story in the commercial, you had prose running down the page for 60 seconds, the screen for 60 seconds. Nobody would ever do that. Star Wars, I guess, is the one example, exception. <laughs> but, but, but who would do that? generally, besides George Lucas. Anyway, but I just think that's crazy. And yet, look at what terrible storytellers people are. So to me, you know, what's the, what, what, in that analogy, what should you do? Put together a compelling PowerPoint deck. Don't make it dense on words. Put those points together. Get them big ideas across. What, do you, you know, what are the three things that when I'm done looking through this thing, you want to make sure I get? And the rest of it, it's just details. And, and anyone who wants to dive in, yes, they're going to be very interested in those details. But don't overwhelm people with details. Right is an important part of this. So your job is to start from the assumption this person has no reason to get what I'm doing and inspire them. Hi, Mr. Eric. My name is Homer. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur working on a chatbot startup uh, in New Hampshire. So my question oh, is... Oh, what, what kind of startup? Uh, chatbot. So when you talk about the ecosystem, uh, is that include the North Reading, even the Manchester in New Hampshire? Um, the reason I'm asking because my wife had a very prestigious career in Dartmouth College. So maybe same reason for you. I have some kind of struggle for love and uh, entrepreneurship for me. Yeah. Maybe you can give a suggestion on that as well. Thank I you. fell in love at Dartmouth College, so I'm all in favor of that. Um, so what I'd say is density matters. You know, when the tech community in Boston moved back into the city, and, and sort of became much less 128. It's still very 128. Certainly very much not 495, right? It used to be, and it, it moved in. There's still a lot of activity in 128, but a lot less. I don't know if people remember, but every VC used to be on Winter Street in Waltham. Now most of them are in the city. Very few, almost, it's almost all dead venture funds that are still in Waltham, right? They're not investing anymore. They're a handful. I don't even know who's still, if anyone is writing checks, who's still in Waltham. And everybody was there. Right, And that density has value. That's that collision value that Silicon Valley has over us. By the way, so does New York. Because New York's expanded a little bit, but so much of what goes on happens between Soho up to the Garment District. Right? That's, that's 40 blocks in New York City, right? two square miles, basically, roughly. Right? There's a lot of value to density. So yes, I do mean, to some extent, Southern New Hampshire is part of our ecosystem. There's certainly a lot of talent there. There's some neat companies. Um, Joe Flaherty, who's part of our team, used to be at Agamatrix in Southern New Hampshire. Uh, Dine has obviously been a company that's done a lot to engage the Boston tech ecosystem who's in Southern New Hampshire. But it's harder. It's a lot harder because you're missing out on that set of co constant collisions, harder to recruit talent. Um, so there's a, there's a cost. To being there. And frankly, in my mind, there's a cost to being in the suburbs, and the further out you are, the bigger that cost. Hartford, Connecticut. So, so. so my question is actually related to, to that. Um, I spent 25 years in Manhattan um, in advertising, some sort of a recovering digital marker, marketer. Um, but my network is all over the US. None of them are here in Boston. Is that going to hurt me if I have a team that's virtual? If I have you know, a partner that's in New York, if I have a partner that's in San Francisco or Miami? I mean, I have this wealth of talent who I've worked with for years and years and years, and I know they can kill it with me. When I come to you, is yeah. that going to be a turnoff? Or are you going to be like, OK, she's got connections. She knows talent when she sees it. Or, oh my god, she doesn't have a team in Boston. So here's how I'd put it. Um, it's a negative, for sure. But I, I have no idea what the proper coefficient is. If we looked across all of the tech ecosystem, what's the coefficient that, that um, is the discount for the liability of virtual teams at the beginning? There's some. If that coefficient is outweighed by the quality of talent, then it's outweighed by the quality of talent. right? I, to me, if there's somebody you believe is world class who's going to join you as a partner, but you're not in the same location, it's harder to do it than if you were in the same location. But if you're going to sub-optimize on the quality of who you go into business with, because that's all you could find locally, you're probably better off. And so these things are trade-offs. But I wouldn't pretend 
that distributed teams um, are as effective as people who can get in the same room together. You can always manage remotely, but you, it's really hard to lead. So when it comes to making really hard decisions and understanding each other and, and, and working through the really hard parts of a business, it's hard to do that in scheduled meetings, you know, scrum, stand-ups, like those things all count, but they're just really, really hard to, even just um, hiring and interviewing, right? Like, you know, they're, you're gonna build a team here, they're gonna build a team there. Maybe different types of teams, but you guys can't get face to face with each other's people that you're hiring. So you don't get each other's opinions. You don't you don't get to each inspire that candidate, which is really important at the beginning. We we went 30 something employees before anyone was hired that I didn't interview. At a certain point it didn't scale and the person who's running HR got annoyed with me. But for a long time, right, we went 30 plus people without us ever hiring somebody. So those early hires, I think it matters. So it's just hard, right? It, um, instilling a similar culture creating the same values, but just communication broadly, right? And you gotta invest a lot, is the other thing I'd say, is make sure that video conferencing is awesome, give a pitch for a high five, one of our companies, but you know, still there's a ways to go, and, and just getting that stuff right is hard. Yeah. So you talked, about, uh, you talked about Uber and how any taxi company could come up with an app. So our company is a competitor of skills and kind of DraftKings, and in every pitch, it's like, well, why couldn't DraftKings do this? And, you know, the answer usually is a story similar to Dropbox and Google Drive. And, you know, I guess I don't necessarily feel like that does justice to me, that answer. Like, I say it, and I'm like, I just feel like it's a kind of a trick question. I was wondering if you had any answers you've heard that knocked it out of the park, or is it just like a how do you deal with this question type question? So, um, it's hard, right? You, you have to look at it in two ways. You have this enormous advantage, right, which is there is a scale company that proves there's a market. That's way better than they had, right, because there was no market. So you could say, well, geez, they had such a great advantage, there was no like, obvious competition for daily fantasy at the time. There was also no proof that daily fantasy was gonna to matter to anybody at the time. So I take th your situation for fundraising over their situation for fundraising in that context. I think what you have to do a great job of articulating is your best insights onto where they're going, what you think their roadmap is, that wouldn't naturally be obvious for them to pursue your roadmap. And why your roadmap creates a great company too. Right, and maybe it's a great money that company that completely undermines them, or it's a great company that coexists well with them. Uh, you know, and I'd be very careful not to be dismissive or defensive. Right, I, I would start off by admiring them. I would start off by saying we love DraftKings. Right, DraftKings first of all proved our market. Right, they proved you can build a billion dollar company in this space. But the big question you should be asking is: Is first mover the whole thing? Do they have network effects we can never compete with? Those are very fair questions. Let me tell you why we feel as though um, those are, are, are not gonna limit our success and what, what we think they're trying to do and where we're trying to go. But I'd be careful not to just say like, our product's better. Like don't Eric, paint it with broad strokes. I think it's very dangerous. Eric, quick question on this because I, I think this does come up a lot. I've seen this in some, yeah. some pitches myself. How often when you hear something like that is it because the presentation leads you to su think or suggest that this item that's being pitched is more of a feature versus a company itself? Yeah, I mean, it may be you're getting that question because the rest of the pitch is not a great narrative yet, but I think you should have done a good enough job telling the whole pitch so that to a certain, first of all, I'd preempt it and I'd have a competition slide because you know you're gonna get the question, but you should be telling the story of your company in a way that already it's sort of obvious to the person why this is a differentiated opportunity from DraftKings. If by the time you get into this conversation, they're pretty dubious of that, I think you've done a relatively, um, you've under uh, served your, your purpose in trying to make sure they understand what's special about your startup. Because if you pitch me something that effectively seems to me like DraftKings, I will be dismissive, right? But if you use DraftKings as an analogy to show me there's a big market, Right, and it's analogous to you, but there are certain dynamics of what you're doing that are meaningfully differentiated and really compelling. It should be obvious to me by the time we get deep on draft on the differences, what the differences are. Yeah.
explain anything about skills, DraftKings as an example, they are fundamentally differentiated products, right? They're still yep. playing kind of a sports competition model, but they're very different in their functional operation. It's much better to be a substitute than a direct competitor for something that's working really well. Yeah. Or you should have a really good insight on how you're going to beat something that's working really well. So, any other questions or... This yeah. is a somewhat of a related question, but as somebody who's coming from a consulting and a business school background, how did you kind of gain the confidence that you had, you know, good solutions to problems that were seemingly very technical? Say again, how did I get the confidence? <clears throat> to believe that you had, you know, like a good solution to problems like, you know, 3D imaging for dentistry. Yeah. That's a pretty technical that you're, you know, you didn't grow up doing dentistry I mean yeah I mean I think I, so as much as I'm harsh on consulting as a career path one of the skill sets you do develop in consulting is you very quickly learn industries and I really do believe that no matter what business you're going into the only way you win is to very quickly become an expert in your industry I don't mean declare yourself an expert you have to be an amazing student of that business right and we used to get the question all the time you know where'd you go to dental school and to us, that was the best compliment, because that meant that I was talking to a dentist, and I had articulated myself within their context in a way that made them think I was a peer of theirs, as opposed to undermining my credibility by saying, you know, I remember like the first week I was talking to dentists about the business, I mentioned the scraper, which is actually called a scaler, right? And you need to know that, right? Like, I, I remember the guy was like, that's called a scaler. And I had completely undermined my credibility um, in that conversation because I didn't know what a standard tool that they use is called, right? And so um, you do, you have to become a great student of that space. And, and I would say to the extent, like B-School and consulting, right? What do you do in B-School? At, at least I think, you know, at, at HBS and many other schools follow the same model. You study 300 cases over two years. So you, and you um, debate what you would do in the context of these entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, or not just entrepreneurs, executives. Um, I think all of those, for, for learning industries, that's a pretty useful um, thing. How do you get the confidence? All, you know, everyone who goes into consulting is pretty much overconfident. So that's, that's uh, um, like, how do you stand up in front of an executive in a business you've been studying for three months part-time and tell them you think you, you know what they should do with their business? That's what consultants do. Consultants do. So I, I think, the, you know, it's like you're trained for overconfidence to some degree, but... I would actually say overconfidence is a really big blind spot. I mean, I think this line in uh, entrepreneurship between having the confidence to know what you're good at and, and the confidence in your business, the whole team and everything you're trying to accomplish, to know when to lean in, but being really careful not to be overconfident because that's what, that's what crushes good, uh, good opportunities. I, a lot of companies die not because they were absolutely wrong or because... Um, they, they wasted their time going after the industry or customers didn't care. Many companies die for those reasons. A lot die because they just build their, they, they just make a lot of mistakes building their business. The opportunity set was good. They just, you know, we have this great story of this company, SeatGeek. Anyone use SeatGeek? SeatGeek's a great, it's just an awesome secondary marketplace for tickets. And there was this company, FanSnap, founded in Boston, and GC put a lot of money into it. And there is like $25 million, I, I don't know the exact number, but something like that. And SeatGeek, you know, started the company by raising something. We led that round. I think it was like a million and a half dollars. And three years, and we just, everyone just said, you're going to get killed by these guys. And four years later, we bought them. Right now, since SeatGeek has raised a lot of money, but they financed their business very intelligently. It wasn't, by the time we bought FanSnap, investors were saying, it's a terrible space. You don't want to be in it. But it was going very well for us. It just wasn't going well for them because in the context of how they funded that company, there was just no way for them to figure things. They didn't have the time to figure things out and uh, try to live up to expectations. They tried, but it, they just didn't have the time to do it. So it's very important to build your business the right way. Maybe one more. And Yeah, um, so I have a question about teams. Obviously, t teams are very important to startups. So as your, from your experience, is it how important it is for all the co-founders of a team to be full-time at the very beginning? Well, there's almost always some phase where not everybody is full-time, right? There's this sort of like company formation phase where um, 
you know, most people aren't sitting on the beach for long periods of time before you form the company, right? So you always have some of this. But what I would tell you is the, the basic atomic unit of a company is the founding team. Way more important than capital. Frankly, way more important even than what market you're going after at the beginning. It's the talent, passion, commitment of those people that end up creating exponential value or not, right? And everything else is almost like um, the efforts of those people and scaling against those efforts as opposed to some of those people end up leaving, some of those, but that formative period defines so much. And I don't really believe once you're in that period, anyone can really be part-time. You can be an advisor and be part-time, but don't pretend you're really at the company or founding the company and sitting around being part-time. I honestly find it insulting to people who are serious about starting businesses. You know, I think at some point you gotta suck it up and really be an entrepreneur. And I think too many people would like to be funded to leave their job. And I don't think that's entrepreneurship. It does happen sometimes. It doesn't usually happen, but it does happen sometimes. At some point you gotta step back and say, I'm gonna take some risk here, right? Like, it, it, founding this company is not just another paid job for me that ultimately might have huge upside, and my big risk is, well, oh my God, what if it goes out of business? Like, I actually think entrepreneurship is way less risky than people think. Startups, joining startups, in my mind, is way less risky. The only way in which it's risky is a way that a lot of people have no tolerance for risk, which is short-term cash flow risk. You have to be able to flow transitions. There's always the risk of transitions. But I don't think there's a lot of employment risk, right? I don't think, I don't know very many entrepreneurs who've tried to find, found businesses, it didn't work out, and then they couldn't find gainful employment. I just don't think that's a real thing. I mean, I, you know, we never laid anyone off at Brontes until we were part of 3M. Go figure, right? We were part of one of the best companies in America, and that was the first time we ever did a layoff. I just don't think you can, I actually think the vulnerability of being an employee at a big company is massive. It's massive. Especially the guy who, who sort of led the biz dev effort to buy us. It wasn't the, the guy I reported to, but the guy who led the biz dev effort. Um, he had been at 3M for over 20 years. Uh, and when the financial crisis came, they laid him off. And his entire network was 3M. It's, it's, a, career, it's a career town. It's a company town. He struggled like crazy to find a new job. Right? Like he'd been floating around 3M for years. He had no credibility at any other organization in the world. Whereas the people we were forced to lay off, um, they all found jobs in like six weeks. Right? Why? Well, they were talented people who were part of a successful acquisition, and some of our alums had already gone elsewhere and recruited them in. And you know, so I, I just think risk is a career risk is actually a very funny thing that people don't think of in really smart ways. I think when you're in the startup world, there's a little more volatility. That's not necessarily truly more risk, but they're like long term. But there's a little more volatility, and because of that, you need to be able to fund transitions. You need to know you have some money in the bank so that you know if your company doesn't work out well, you you have some time to figure out what you want to do. And but ultimately, I, I think um, these are you know people who work at startups tend to be the most employable people because they work fast, they speak deeply about what they've done. It's like it's very compelling, right, to hire people who have worked at startups. So. Anyway, that's my, my pitch for the startup world, but um, yes, people start off part-time. That's an inevitability because there is this formation thing. It's how it works, but very quickly, you got to put up or shut up, and if you're really not, if you're on the fence and, you know, I'm not sure, you're not founding that company. You're going to hit other volatile moments, not just that one, and if you're freaking out like you weren't even sure you wanted to start the company, don't start the company. Stay at EMC. <laughs> like, don't start the company. Like, I think you've got to have a drive and a passion. Like, the other biggest myth, I think, in this whole startup world is it's about money. It's not about money. If you're starting companies because you think you're going to get rich, go do something else. It is the worst risk-adjusted um, probability of return of anything you could ever do. Right? Do it because most startups fail. Do it because you have a passion to solve a problem and you couldn't think of anything more exciting than birthing something into the world. It's like children, like in the sense that, you know, children are very rarely a profitable affair for anybody. They cost a lot of money, right? And they're a lot of effort and they're exhausting, but they're incredibly rewarding because, you know, nurturing and, and creation, nurturing, building, um, those are all human instincts that are very uh, exciting. And if those are the things around the business world that excite you too, by all means, those are great reasons to do it. And by the way, when you do a great job and it works out, yes, you can make a lot of money. But don't look at it backwards and go, the richest people I know all founded great companies and therefore that's the way to make 
a good living. I would say if you're starting there, you will give up way too early because there are always periods that just look like it's not going to work. And then what do you do? You know, like, you know, you just keep funneling your money into it. You keep working on something that's going nowhere. You haven't paid yourself for nine months. You just can't. So you got to have a greater drive that goes beyond, I want to make money. If you want to make money, figure out how to get into a hedge fund. Those guys like mint money for no like meaningful reason in the world. Go, go there. If you want to build value, like really build stuff and make a dent, some small dent in the world because you were the one. I mean, I got to uh, one last very quick story because you guys have tolerated two hours of me. But my daughter is 10. Six months ago, I was able to take her to an orthodontist office and they scanned her mouth and they created a retainer for her. You know, it's my little corner of the world, right? It's not like I didn't say, you know, tomorrow I'm doing an event with Paul English. He is like building educational institutions in Haiti. What he's doing is amazing. But I did this little thing, and I was able to say to my daughter afterwards, because she was scanned on our device that 3M now sells, I was able to say to my daughter afterwards, that is something that exists because we dreamed it, dreamt it up. And that is something that exists because we had the passion, the energy, the perseverance to bring it into the world. And if we didn't do that, it wouldn't exist. Right, like we all take the world for granted as something that would have inevitably happened. And when you're an entrepreneur, the truth is whatever it is you're working on, at least the way you would do it, would never have inevitably happened. It's the same thing as your kids, right? Your kids are unique DNA. They are their own independent things that would never have existed in the world if you didn't choose to have children, right? And so to me, that's the stuff like it's years and years later and I'm still so proud to show my daughter that if you dream of something, you can make it happen. And hopefully, she picks something even more noble than dentistry. But, um, but still, that's a really exciting aspect of entrepreneurship. If those are the things that drive you, I think those are great reasons to found businesses. Awesome. I think we'll wrap up on that, you know, I, especially because you just reminded me I have a big financial obligation coming down the pipeline in about two weeks here. So thank you Dave's for that. Dave's expecting Eric, so. a second child. Yeah, so, but. <laughs> Quick, quick, uh, you know, sh thank you again to Pivotal, to the meme, Chamber, and thank certainly to Eric and Founder Collective for joining yeah. us. Thank you, buddy.